Great. Visual disabilities. I will ask the speakers to give a quick visual description of themselves at the beginning of their statements. And I will do the same. I'm Michal Rimon, uh, I'm just after uh, a visit to my uh, hairdresser. So I'm now, he said, blondish, um, uh, wearing a black shirt. And behind me, whoever knows Access Israel would recognize this is the most accessible picture uh, painting in Israel, um, painted by Ben Rotman uh, in memory of his daughter, who was my um, um, deputy, Neta Rotman, uh, who would love to be here. So at least she's here with me, just in the back of me. Uh, now we have sign language provided and you can pin the translators uh, so you can see them while seeing the speaker as well. The names of our translators today are Richard F. He's our rock star. He's already active right now. And later we'll be joined by Pamela S, S as in Sam. And uh, uh, Sharon will uh, put these two names in the chat right now for your convenience. You can find them, pin them. And if you have, of course, any issues, you can message us in the chat or write directly to Sharon Kessler, who is uh, part of this webinar. Now, I would like to thank our great partners at Language People for providing the sign language translators every time we can't do it without them. We are also uh, today with live captioning, which is provided by our friends at Verbit. You can turn on the uh, captioning when you go to the bottom of the Zoom screen and click on CC. If you have any problems, again, write us in the chat. In addition, the webinar is recorded and you will receive a, a link uh, to the full recordings of the presentations. And you can also join us on Facebook Live for whoever is interested. We will upload the recording of the webinar to the Global Accessibility website. You can find the link to the website in the chat now. Again, any questions, any issues, just write us. We'll be very happy to help. So welcome to you all. We are so happy to welcome you to the Access Israel Network for Accessible Future. This is a network of experts, policymakers, technologies, service providers, business representatives, and many more. We started this webinars as a series of COVID-19, let's get together and find solutions and share and learn from each other. The goal of this network is really to come together, to remove barriers and make sure that no one is left behind. As I said before, the number of participants grew from one webinar to the next, and it's amazing to see the amazing network that has been created here. One of the things I love about this network is bringing together amazing professionals and organizations from all over the world, each doing amazing things in their neck of the world. And one of the lemonades of the COVID-19 lemon is that now we can share much more with digitally participating in events like this that are taking place even on the other side of the world for some of you, enabling us to learn what other countries are doing to overcome the challenges that people with disabilities face every day. Now let's just be clear, Klaus, I'm sure that you will agree with me. I still always prefer face-to-face -face meetings, especially when they include a duty-free shopping uh, retreat, but until they reopen the skies, we will continue these webinars and we want to see you here with us. Now to the tachlis. Tachlis is a word, very useful word in Hebrew, meaning practical, the essence of what we're here for. So the tachlis here is that we have today participants from all over the world joining to talk about smart cities. And now we can all make sure that as we progress to a more technological, digital city, we make sure it is accessible for all. Today, we will understand what a smart city is, how we can make sure our cities will not only progress to be smart, but will also do so in a way that is accessible and inclusive for all. Now, from looking at the countries and cities of origins from all of you, we see that we are a very diverse group. Some of us are already living in cities that are smart. They have technologies, technologies all around us. We already are used to consume services digitally Others though are coming from less technological venues, but still this subject is relevant to us all. Our wish is that each and every one of us take something today from this amazing lineup of speakers. Remember, even a small city that just opened a website, maybe even is using one small application, 
can, as far as I'm concerned, be considered smart because my focus is not how smart you are, but rather making sure how accessible anything smart you use is for all the residents and visitors. For this webinar on accessible, inclusive smart cities, we have partners with the experts, G3 ICT, who are doing so much in this field and are leaders when it comes to smart cities. Thank you, James Thurston and Axel Lebrois for this great partnership. In addition, I would like to say thank you to our sponsors of this webinar, Google, who have been a great support to our international activities and especially the webinars up till now, the US Embassy in Israel, who have supported us for many years. And thanks to them, we have been able to reach amazing, inspiring speakers from the US throughout the years. Step here, a longtime partner and friend of Access Israel who develops solutions to enhance accessibility in the built environment in public spaces, public transportation, crosswalks, and are therefore a perfect partner for this webinar. We will hear from them later on. I would like to take this opportunity and thank our other friends because without you guys, we wouldn't be here. Zero Project, Valuable 500, Phaser, Ru Global, Enable, Manzil, ONSE, IAAP, the Austrian Association for the Blind, sorry Klaus, I'm not trying to say it in uh, Austrian, Global Ramp, Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, and many, many more. As a network, it gives me great satisfaction, not only to promote what we at Access Israel are doing, but to share and enable all of you to enjoy what our dear partners are doing. So the highlights for this time are, write it down in your uh, uh, calendar, uh, on April 27 to 29, a three-day virtual summit annual summit by the Christopher Reeve Foundation, bringing together hundreds of health professionals, advocates, community members, and caregivers to explore topics relevant to the paralysis community. We have uh, April 29th to May 5th, the Real Ability Field Festival for whoever is in the US or is using VPN. I don't really know what that means, but I understand that's your ticket into the festival. It should be amazing. And I would also like to share one more thing. The WTO, the World Tourism Organization, has gone out with a great uh, uh, call for action. They are looking for um, initiatives from all over the world that combine tourism, accessibility, and preparedness to COVID-19. And we want to show them what is done. Look at the half full of the glass and not the empty one. So if you have um, uh, something to share with the world about a tourist attractions that is taking accessibility and COVID into consideration, please share and you will see a link now in uh, the chat for that um, uh, nomination. Okay, guys, that's it. We're beginning. I would like to remind our speakers to speak clearly and slow so everyone can follow as this is a very international club crowd. And I also want to mention that everyone is on a different level on their path to accessibility and inclusion here. And that's okay. Today is all about learning, sharing, and creating new connections. So let's dive into it. Our opening remark is a longtime friend. And I think he was the opening speaker in our first webinar. Uh, Ambassador Luis Galagos, the chairman of G3 ICT. Uh, now, he really wanted to be with us, but lucky for him, he is now on vacation and he made sure to send us a video. So, um, uh, Ambassador Luis Galagos, he was the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs in Ecuador until July 2020, and before that, Ambassador in many uh, positions earlier. But as I said, today he is the chairman of G3 ICT. Sean, please. One second. As I always say, you know that in general and specifically in digital webinars, something will always go wrong. For me to participate in this eighth uh, in this eighth international webinar of inclusive accessible smart cities, uh, 
I am addressing you from the, sending you a short video from the Galapagos Islands, uh, one of the uh, heritages of humanity. It's an extraordinary place, and I hope you can come and visit. Uh, Ecuador has taken, uh, uh, has made a lot of efforts to, uh, to have uh, sustainable conservation here, and it is a marvelous place uh, as a testimony to, to nature, uh, biodiversity, and the care human beings have to have, have to, uh, to make of, uh, of nature. We are dealing with a subject today that is of primary importance, which is uh, in, uh, accessible uh, smart cities, inclusive accessible smart cities. Uh, and uh, you know, GTICT has been involved in this issue for many years under the guidance to, under the leadership of James Thornston and uh, Axel Lebois. Uh, we began this venture of, uh, uh, of accessible uh, uh, accessibility and information communication technology in the year 2006, even before the convention was signed. Uh, Axel Lebois created G3ICT and asked me to be the chair uh, of the Board of Trustees. Uh, our endeavor has been to use technologies of information communication technologies uh, for the benefit of persons with disabilities. But uh, it is more than that. It is uh, after this extraordinarily complicated era of COVID-19, it is a necessity of survival for all human beings that the use of information and communication technology be accessible, uh, not only in terms of, uh, of connotations of being useful, but being also uh, uh, to places where you do not have uh, uh, internet capabilities. The world has changed and changed dr dramatically since the COVID-19 epidemic. It has changed the, the, the working methodologies. Uh, the, uh, the medical uh, sector has changed. Uh, the, the, uh, the social, the, the social uh, implications, education and others are, are to be changed forever. Therefore, we must make an added effort to have inclusive smart cities as one of the objectives uh, of, uh, of the world to be. We must include the 1 billion people with uh, 1 million persons with disabilities around the world. We must include aging. We plan to work diligently on the issue of integrating the 1 billion people who are under the process of aging as I am into the, uh, into the sequence of the use of information and communication technologies. I believe it is a primary necessity that we all look at a private public venture in where we have the capabilities of all the, the developers of these technologies to enhance the living conditions, the living standards, uh, and the, the well-being of persons with disabilities and persons with aging. The number I have just quoted is 2 billion people. Two billion who are also assisted by caretakers, their families, their wives, their children. Therefore, your, your, the universe of these persons will be four to five billion people. I think that it is uh, measured in a, in a very broad way, as I have just said it, but we will need the capabilities of all to enhance the accessibility of smart cities where most of the population of the world will live by 2050. And we must give them the capabilities and standards of living that we need. Where most of the population of the world will live by 2050. Uh, we must give them the capabilities and standards of living that we need to have them, ha the, that they need to have in order to survive with dignity and being inclusive in all parts of society. I wish you the best in this webinar. It is an honor to participate in the name of G3ICT. Uh, you know the team of G3ICT is, covers a great expand in this issue, and I trust that the, this webinar will be a step forward in looking at this problem from all aspects and being able to deal with the public policies that emanate from the convention as a tool to making this a reality. Thank you very much, and I wish you the best.
Thank you so much to Ambassador uh, Louis Galagos, our dear friend, and I am very happy to invite our next um, uh, opening speaker, uh, Anna Koni Sedel. I hope that I uh, pronounced it okay. Uh, the process manager and business manager from Zero Project Austria, the organization that got me hooked on this international uh, uh, amazing world. So please, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Michael, for the invitation and this great possibility to present the Zero Project and also to talk about the upcoming call for nomination on the topic of accessibility. So my name is Anna Königseder and I'm working for the Zero Project here in Vienna. I, uh, I have uh, chin length brown hair, I wear glasses and I'm wearing a, um, a jacket in a bright beige color. So I will give a short introduction of what we do and who we are, and then I will give a little bit more details on this, this upcoming call for nominations 2022 on the topic of accessibility. So I will share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Yes. Should be. Can everyone see my screen? Or Michael, can you see the screen? Yes. Good. So the Zero Project is an initiative of the ESL Foundation, and we are looking for innovative practices and policies that support people with disabilities. We offer a platform uh, for exchange. Our research data is available for free on our website and will be soon also be available via a new uh, web search portal. We publish an annual report that presents all the awardees of the current annual research cycle and we also organize an annual conference. We have recently published the Zero Project Almanac 2021, um, a publication that we are very proud of. This is a publication that is available for free as a download on our website. And uh, this will help you to discover the, um, our research uh, since 2013. In addition, we have recently launched also our Zero Project video portal, where you can currently watch all sessions of the Zero Project online conference that took place last February. As I mentioned before, uh, our next call for nomination will be on the topic of accessibility, and uh, it will, will be launched soon at the beginning of May. The Zero Project seeks to identify the most innovative projects all around the world from different sectors, civil society, business sector, public sector and ICT. All the nominated projects will be selected by our huge Zero Project network of experts in a multi-step process. And in summary, there are three decisive selection criteria. It's innovation, impact and scalability. We are looking for innovations that are creative and new. Projects have to show pro proven and measurable impact and the solutions should be easily, easy, easily uh, replicable to, another, to other countries, to other regions or also to other contexts. So why uh, should you nominate? Uh, chosen practices and policies have exposure to global audience of disability organizations, UN agencies, leaders and experts, and often receive media coverage in their own country. All awardees will be featured in the Zero Project report, and they will become part of the Zero Project database of innovative practices that will be available soon uh, via our web search portal that will be launched in early autumn 2021. The awardees will also be invited to speak uh, at the Zero Project Conference where they will have the possibility to present their projects. And this conference really is uh, a unique meeting point of innovators and, and change makers. Uh, in addition, uh, Zero Project awardees are eligible to apply for further opportunities, such as joining the Accelerator Program Zero Project Impact Transfer. 
So if you uh, would like to stay connected and receive regular updates, please write us an email at, to office at zeroproject.org and keep um, stay updated. Um, we will soon publish uh, updated information on the upcoming call on our website, but also on our social media channels. So thanks for your attention. And I'm really looking Thank forward you. to learn more about these projects that are presented today. Thank, Thank you. you. And whenever I, I want to get, you know, psyched up, definitely the Innovations in Zero project are a great, great way to do it. And in the chat, you have now uh, the, the address, mail address, office at zeroproject.org. Yes. I urge each and every one of you, join me and register and, and send your innovations. It should be amazing. Our final opening statement is from really a representing a long time uh, partner and supporter of the US uh, uh, Embassy here in Israel, Joe Virix, Virix uh, well the, counselor, yeah, the counselor for public affairs in the US Embassy in Jerusalem, Israel. Please, Joe. Uh, well, uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to our, uh, to our audience and participants all around the world. Uh, I mean, I knew this was uh, truly a global event, but to see all the locations that have popped up as people have announced where they're, uh, they've dialed in from, it's astounding how truly global this event is. Uh, the visuals, uh, I, uh, uh, I am bespectacled. I, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, brown hair that's thinner than it used to be. I have a beard that's more salt and pepper than it used to be. I'm wearing a, a white shirt, open collar under a blue blazer. And I'm sitting in uh, a room where the drop has kids' drawings on the wall uh, because I'm uh, in what is both my home office and my home classroom uh, through, uh, through the COVID pandemic. Uh, so the U.S. Embassy has uh, been supporting Access Israel for most 10 years now. Uh, it, the United States strives to be a leader in the field of accessibility and disability rights. And, and we're proud to share our experience with Israeli colleagues doing this important work. Uh, we firmly believe that creating a more inclusive, accessible, and smart world uh, is an achievable goal so long as we continue to work together and learn from each other. Uh, now, this event is dedicated to an important topic but one that we did not foresee when the embassy first decided to support Access Israel's international conference in 2020, uh, we awarded Access Israel a public diplomacy grant. Uh, and this was in keeping with our goals of helping our Israeli government and NGO partners create a shared society and an inclusive economy for all Israelis of all backgrounds and all abilities. Now at the time we couldn't have imagined the immense challenges that disabled persons would face as they adapted to the realities of the pandemic, job losses, telework, and the temporary suspension of many government services. We didn't know yet about this opportunity to rebuild and reimagine our cities and workplaces in the post-COVID era, to be more flexible, inclusive, and accessible. It was almost exactly one year ago that Access Israel was supposed to hold their annual international convention. But instead of just canceling or postponing it, the organizers chose to convert it into an opportunity to expand their community worldwide. Now, the previous webinars have seen Israeli and American experts embracing uh, activists and individuals and organizations from all around the world and creating this amazing opportunity. Uh, the beginnings of a global task force committed to promoting civil rights and practical solutions and creating a better, more accessible future for people with mixed abilities. Now, you all understand that the future we're talking about is not just for the 20% of the world's population defined as people with disabilities or special needs. Uh, the idea of accessible smart cities for all is not to create separate paths and communities for each group, but to create one inclusive reality that serves equally well all members of society. Being smart is being inclusive. Being inclusive is being smart. Now, it's heartwarming to see hundreds of people from all around the world joining us for this event. It's also an indicator of how relevant this topic is. So kudos to Access Israel, our longtime friend and partner, for bringing us all here together for this discussion uh, and 
to the many project partners and participants for your passion and commitment. We at the U.S. Embassy are proud to be part of this community, and I personally look forward to learning more. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, and looking forward to continuing this amazing uh, partnership. So to our first speaker of the day, I am giving the microphone to James Thurston, Vice President at G3 ICT, coming from the USA, and he will talk about Smart Cities for All, the newest models. James, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Good morning from Washington, DC. Uh, I'm James Thurston. I'm a, a white male. Um, I wear glasses. I'm wearing a blue shirt. I'm in a sort of white or tannish room with a few uh, pictures from India on the wall. Uh, and I'm, I've been looking forward to this event. I, I really want to thank the entire Access Israel team, Yuval, Michal, Rani, and Sharon. Um, G3 ICT really uh, enjoys and benefits from, from this partnership with Access Israel. So uh, thank you so much for that. I'm going to put up uh, some slides. One second. Here we go. Can you can you uh, do the uh, sharing? Yeah, I'm I'm slowly Perfect. getting there. <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. We're here. All right. I'm going to try to put in a presentation view here. One second. Okay. I think that's working. Um, so uh, what we want to do is is talk a lot, What I want to do is talk a little bit about these new models um, for for smart cities. Um, a good friend of, uh, I think, many of us, and a colleague of many of us, Karen Tamley, who was with the city of Chicago and is now with Access Living in Chicago, said at the beginning of the pandemic that 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 crises like the pandemic, emergencies like the pandemic, they they reaffirm, they they tell us things that we already know. Uh, and I think what we've learned from this pandemic is that. Um, smart cities today are, are not necessarily working for everyone. They're not accessible for everyone and that we really do need to, to think about, come up with some, some new models for, for more inclusive and accessible smart cities. So G3ICT is, is partnering with uh, all kinds of organizations from civil society and disabled persons organizations to, to universities. And we'll be hearing from, from Dr. Anat Kaspi later today from the University of Washington about some exciting work they're doing, uh, including in partnership with us. Um, certainly with companies and, and, and others to, to think about what is this new model? How do we want to approach and, and really define uh, what a better, more inclusive smart city is? Sorry, James. Yes. Sorry, James. I guess that you are um, showing the, your desktop and not the, the, the presentation. Okay. Well, it's so you you probably, yeah. Okay. It shows the, the, other, the, other, the other screen. Uh, yeah. Is that better or no? Mm, more or less, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you present, you have to to select exactly the the, the screen. Yeah, no, this is the your 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 screen. Okay. Uh... Anyhow, you we can see, eh? Anyhow, so it's just for better presentation. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's showing in the in the in the the full screen for me. Um, uh, so. Maybe to start, it's good to think about what uh, what are we talking about with a smart city? Uh, and, and there's lots of definitions. There's probably as many definitions of a smart city as there are smart cities or cities. Uh, but the one that we like to use and we often use is that a, a smart city uses information and communication technologies to enhance the livability of a city, the workability of a city, and the sustainability of, the, of a city. And this actually comes from the smart cities. Council. Uh, I like this definition because it, it focuses on ICTs, but it also has livability in there, uh, which I think is important to really think about the, the human aspect of cities, the, the, the smart city solutions and technologies. It's not just about being more efficient and cost savings. Uh, we really should be using these technologies, these smart solutions um, to improve the lives of, of people, everyone in the city, uh, whether they live there or they're visiting there. Um, and, and they can, and, and we can we can do that. Uh, I would probably add to this, particularly looking in over the past year, uh, that, that 
smart cities use technology to improve the, uh, the resiliency of cities as well. Uh, and I think we, we need to be thinking more and more in cities, in urban environments about the use of technology for emergency preparedness and response, including for people with disabilities. So we know that there's an enormous digital transformation happening in cities uh, all over the world, um, big cities, small cities. Uh, Michal mentioned that, uh, I, I think similar to what Michal mentioned, we, we sort of let cities opt in to whether or not they're a smart city. If, if they uh, have a website in a, a mobile app and want to be a, a, called a smart city, that's great. We just wanna make sure that these technology deployments are accessible and usable by everyone. Uh, so we're seeing in cities all over the world uh, the use of technology to support the, the really broad range of services that every city provides. I, I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, my city is using uh, technology for, for transportation planning, mobility as a service, uh, certainly digital payments, whether it's uh, paying for a license or paying a fine, um, citizen engagement. I get an enormous amount of information from my city uh, about what's happening, uh, including emergencies or shootings or uh, streets that are shut down. Uh, but I'm also able to use that, those citizen engagement channels, those digital citizen engagement channels to give information to my city uh, and to ask questions of my city to report uh, a street light that's out or, um, or, or a pothole uh, or in many other things. So the, the, the use of, of technology is, is amazing to support the broad range of city services. But what we know from our work at G3ICT in the Global Smart Cities for All initiative is that too often these technology deployments, these smart solutions uh, are not accessible. And in fact, when we, when we launched our smart cities work several years ago, we did a global study and, and found that smart cities today are actually making the digital divide worse, not better for people with disabilities. Um, because the, these technology assets, these smart solutions are not accessible to everyone. And you don't really have to, to look too far to find an example of, of uh, technology deployments of, of smart solutions that are, are not necessarily working for everyone. I, I mentioned I live in Washington. We have a, a COVID data dashboard um, that every day updates the data on hospitalization rates, infection rates, um, now vaccination rates in the city. Uh, amazing information, very useful information to the people, the, the more than 700,000 people living in this city, but that dashboard is not accessible. So not really usable by uh, a large, part of the population that really needs that critical information. We've, uh, we've just you know, heard about the, the, in Australia, the vaccination um, website where you go to find out if you can get an appointment, that's also not accessible. So there's, there's real issues when these deployments, uh, these exciting uh, smart solutions are not accessible to people with disabilities. But we can uh, really define a better model, a new model for more inclusive smart cities. And one of the ways that we're doing that at G3ICT is uh, I mentioned in partnership with our, our pretty broad and global ecosystem um, from civil society and disabled persons organizations, from industry, from academia, uh, and certainly from, from government as well, to define what, what is this new model for an inclusive smart city, a city that's using technology and using data. The, uh, the way that we're defining an inclusive smart city is actually through an assessment tool that we've created, a maturity model assessment tool um, that, that looks at the core capabilities that every smart city and really every city needs to be building to be smarter, to be using technology and data. But we put an accessibility and inclusion and disability lens on those, those core capabilities. Uh, so we, we've defined 18 different capabilities that every city should be building to be more inclusive as it's becoming smarter. Um, we, we organize those capabilities into, into five buckets or pillars is what we call them. Uh, and so it, it includes things like having a, a, a focus on strategic intent to be more inclusive as it's becoming smarter. And there we look at things like the leadership, the role of the leadership in the city. We look at the budgeting process. Uh, it's one thing to say that you have a commitment to accessibility and inclusion in your technology deployments, but how are you funding and supporting those? Uh, we look at making sure that there's a business case for accessibility. And we look at, does the, the city even have a digital inclusion strategy? Most cities will have an IT strategy, an open data strategy, but does it have digital inclusion as part of those strategies? We look at uh, several different aspects of culture. Culture is critically important to, to smart cities uh, and important to inclusive smart cities. 
So there we're looking at um, the, the culture of innovation. Does the city support and participate in inclusive uh, urban innovation ecosystem? Uh, does it work with its accelerators and incubators to make sure that these exciting new solutions being created are accessible uh, as well? Um, does it have a culture of diversity? One of the things that we've heard over and over again from the cities that we work with is that when a city hires people with disabilities, it changes the focus and the perspective uh, and really embeds in the DNA of the city uh, a commitment to accessibility. We look at a, a range of different capabilities related to the governance and process systems of the, of the city. Uh, does the city use measurement? Does it have metrics? Does it, does it measure itself in its own progress related to inclusion and accessibility? Um, procurement is key as part, one of the, the governance and processes that we look at. Is it making sure that all of its investments in technology are accessible and how is it making sure? Um, and obviously we look at technology and data. Technology uh, being the, the backbone of smart cities and data being the, the lifeblood of smart cities. Both of those can either support greater inclusion uh, as a smart city or present barriers. So we're looking at, at capabilities there like uh, how does the city know if its technology assets are, are accessible? Um, does it have a process in place to understand what it's deploying and the accessibility of it? And, and importantly, what does it do when it finds out that it's not accessible? How does it fix that? So we've been using this, this uh, maturity model assessment tool with cities around the world uh, with partners to, to really help cities see uh, where they're doing well and where they need to can improve to have a stronger commitment and capability um, on accessibility and inclusion as part of being uh, a, a, an inclusive smart city. Uh, the way that we use the tool is, is uh, we, we do an assessment with a, an expert team and we're able to across these 18 capabilities give a, a quantitative score of one to five, one being not very good, not much capability or commitment, five being world-class for whatever that capability is. More importantly, I think than these scores is the result is a roadmap to make improvements. So if you're at level two for, for your partnerships or your procurement, the way you get to level three, four, and five becomes very, very clear. James, another, one minute or one and a half minute, please. Thank yeah, you. Almost done. Uh, another really exciting aspect of, of this new model of, of inclusive smart cities uh, in this tool is the ability to, to benchmark. So we can work with a city to understand uh, its own scores, but how does it relate to the average of scores, the benchmark against other cities around the world? And uh, just briefly, what, we, what we're seeing in the data as we work with more and more cities is that uh, they do relatively well on things like leadership and diversity and, and um, working on technology adoption or, or the digital divide. And they do less well on metrics and, and, uh, and the data kinds of capabilities. Um, we know cities are, around the world are, have some great good practices and I always like to point those out. Uh, New York City, for example, we'll be hearing from, from uh, someone from there later, but they do really well on procurement. Um, Rio de Janeiro has, has instituted a, a good pro program for training all of its IT professionals in the city on accessibility, which is important. They've also embedded accessibility into their communications guide for the city. So there's really uh, interesting good practices that, that you can capture and, and hopefully help to deploy through partnerships like Access Israel. Um, so our challenge, uh, and I think in partnership with, with uh, many of you out there, is, is to really challenge cities around the world to be both smarter uh, absolutely smarter, use more technology, use more data for your services, but also more inclusive as you're doing that. Um, you can find out more about the, our approach to inclusive smart cities at smartcitiesforall.org. Thanks very much. Thank you, James, very much. Now just un, uh, unshare your, uh, your um, uh, presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, is for me, the guy that brought me into all this, Yuval Wagner, the founder and chairperson of Access Israel. He established Access Israel more than 20 years ago. And he is also on the advisory board for Smart City for All and the World Economic Forum. So Yuval, please. Yuval, you are on mute. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi everyone, I'm opening straight my presentation. Let's uh, go for that. 
Um, so I'll start. Um, so thank you everyone. Uh, a lot of friends are here, a lot of colleagues. And I will share with you about smart cities and especially the case here in Israel, which is a pretty unique uh, case in my dear. And I will share with you our thoughts of ways of implementing accessibility and inclusion in smart cities in Israel. Well, first of all, you should know that Israel is a gigantic country of only 9.3 million people. So our big country is probably small, medium countries, small, medium cities around the world. So in Israel, we have 257 cities all around, and all the citizens are, as I said, 9.3 million citizens. And one of the things that we have to learn from our experience of implementing accessibility is that one of the bigger things that we have to learn of is not doing things retroactively. If we just would be smart enough that every new thing we do especially when we're talking about smart cities and technologies and ICT, would be no more retroactively, but doing it by design, day one, this as, as one tip or one action will be amazing to change the future. So anyway, our mission is making sure Israel development of smart cities will be accessible but it, accessible by design for all disabilities in, er, in all areas of life. Now, um, why doesn't it change? Now, in Israel laws, which is a little different from other countries, our laws already demand that by 2021, all cities will be accessible by the physical environment, training uh, all staff of the municipalities on how to give accessible services. All the ATMs, websites, and apps must be accessible by law and, and can be sued if they are not. Accessible call centers, including those that will be with technologies or like bots and others have to be accessible. All the information have to be accessible. All the events and much more have to be accessible by the Israeli accessibility equal rights law. And it also have to be accessible in all spheres of life, education, transportation, health, sport, businesses, cultures, municipality and parks. So all of this, which is a lot in the, in the regular smart city, especially in a, in a smart city is already in the laws and have to be done. But still, when we are here gathered on talking about smart cities, and I love the definition that James brought up with the livability, because I, I would say more about the livability. At the end of the day, it's people like me, which I forgot to describe myself. I'm Yuval Wagner, I'm a bold person with a roundish face, wearing a gray shirt and talking for my office. So I'm one, one, one of those 18% in each country that needs accessibility for its daily living. And what we have to make sure and understand that living, it's not one technology yes and one not. One is medium and one is rare. We need it all. We need it all to be fully accessible, fully inclusive for the use of all kinds of disabilities. And in order of that, we have to make sure it's happening everywhere in all cities, and in all technologies or all services that are based on technologies. And so what we plan to do here is actually 
you will hear in a few minutes Sergio, which I just lately met and we are partnering with them on it's the Association of Accessibility Smart, of, of Smart Cities in Israel. And we are together going to try to engage the, feder the Federation of Local Authorities in Israel because we want to work not city and another city and another city. We want, to, we want to work with all of them. So we'll get the maximum to maximize our effect in making all of them accessible. And the first thing we will do, we'll make sure they fully understand what we mean. They fully understand why it's so important for me and people with disabilities and for them as, as, as municipalities. We want to define the cities that are ready to this kind of path, to this kind of implementation. And we will do three things. One, we will make sure that they are complying with the accessibility laws that already existing. Two, we will implement model procedures because as we said, we are partners with smart cities for all. They have the models, we just have to implement them. And I'm telling you, it's not complicated. It's actually very easy. And, and, and lastly, we are thinking of launching a yearly smart city accessibility index. So we will have some kind of measurement, but also competition between cities. So I want to end by this statement. We should strive to maximum quality of life and inclusion for people with disability using smart cities ICT. It's not only doing those technologies that came by, which are buying or deciding to make them accessible. It's making sure that we also innovate other technologies, making sure we live full accessible life in our smart cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuval, and thank you also for keeping time schedule. This is the part that I don't like about my uh, job now. Um, um, our next speaker is Sergio Vinitsky. Uh, he is the CEO of uh, VISERCO, uh, uh, -E Smart City Expo, World Congress, Barcelona Delegate for Israel. And he will uh, present about smart cities, best services for smart citizens. Sergio, please. Hi. First of all, Yuval, if you said that you won't all forget about this, it will never happen. Maybe some, a few, but not all. Now, uh, hi. Uh, my name is Sergio. I have in my background some uh, business logos of the Smart City Expo World Congress in Barcelona, Vicerco, LTD, it's my company, and the Israeli Smart City Institute. I'm wearing a white shirt and a blazer. Yesterday, at the same hour, I wore a yellow a t shirt of Maccabi Tel Aviv because they play football, soccer with the, another. Uh, I, I was watching it with my two sons. So now I'm officially clothing uh, changed. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm the CEO of a consulting named Viserco and the co founder of the Israeli Smart City Institute and also delegate uh, for Israel of the Smart City Barcelona World Congress. Uh, the leader world, uh, worldwide event in smart cities. So practically I'm coming from the side of the smart cities. I was born in Argentina. My name is Argentinian. So my Spanglish is uh, great. You can understand it's a merge of Spanish and English. Now, um, smart cities exist, but no one has uh, seen them yet. Uh, and uh, sorry, James, that I have another definition. There are thousands of definitions for smart cities. Uh, so this is perhaps one of the characteristics that define the smart cities. They use technology to make the lives of citizens uh, easier, but without citizens even noticing that. The objective is, uh, the objective is uh, to create a sustainable environment that uh, optimize the use that citizens make of public spaces, for example, or facilitates uh, mobility. 
but there's a group of the population for whom smart cities can make a fundamental difference, those people with disabilities. Technology can be uh, used to make cities more accessible, as is uh, currently the case with the use of audible signals uh, when traffic lights turn uh, uh, green, for example. As uh, smart city planners, we wish always to that as many people as possible will include uh, will be included in the, in their communities. Uh, so we have to think that things are that are usually for many people nice to have sometimes become must to have. And towards those, we have to focus uh, uh, more fo uh, forces and, of course, uh, more resources, more money. In management, you know that even if your department or your place of work is the best, the organization might fall on the interfaces, unfortunately. Uh, the same, in, and in parallel, this with accessibility. It exists everywhere, in the university, at home, at the grocery, at the, in the factory, in the street practically in every organization or entity or place, it's not enough that the, every department of every room or every room uh, or every hall will provide adequate services. We should not fall in the interfaces. And unfortunately, it happens a lot. Uh, we have to be aware about that. Now, Smart City, as I said, uh, sorry, Val, sorry, James, has many definitions, too many, let's say. Uh, the common definition is improving the quality of life of the resident. But let's define a resident. Everyone, some of them, divided by what? By gender, by age, by sex, by special needs. Uh, there's a, an expanding diversity of types of residents, and it is not always possible to get down to the broadest common denominator or to include all in each place or a situation. Uh, there is a great danger of cities being too smart, but unfortunately not too human. Uh, so when we come to work on it, uh, are we aiming for smart cities or for smart uh, citizens? Uh, one of the most difficult challenges in planning cities is to decide if we, make, if we make it top down planning by the municipality or bottom up by the residents, a big challenge. It involves courage, of course, politics, a lot of interest, opposing uh, forces, budget, of course, you name it. A, a key part of uh, a, a, this design is uh, to meet the challenges of uh, usable technologies. Which some people mentioned it before me. Uh, usability. You cannot argue with thousands of users. Uh, in some cities, residents are asked, but what about visitors, tourists? What about workers from nearby cities? They are not uh, asked uh, what to, to uh, how to improve the services for the cities. We always say that the resident is in the middle, in the center, and around it, the technologies and the municipality. Uh, the goal is to build an ecosystem around this, uh, around us, around the residents. Uh, then back to the definition of who is a resident and is, is, a, resi is a resident any resident? Uh, we have been hearing more and more in the recent years, the technology for residents, the citizens, we call it with the many names. The common one is IoT, Internet of Things. We hear recently the term of IOE, the Internet of Everything. Personally, I would call uh, the it IFP, Internet for People, uh, from the technology criterion to the social criterion. In uh, 2014, Tel Aviv won the, the, won the Smart City Award at the Smart City Conference in Barcelona. Believe me, I was there. Uh, it uh, started then with the free and massive Wi-Fi throughout the city that uh, allowed the resident card, the digital, digital Tel Aviv, digital to be relevant for all residents, interact with everyone. It was quite pioneer then in creating a community among the neighbors and involve them through technology. Uh, the members become the sellers and the residents, uh, the residents, uh, the customers. As I said before, internet for people. Uh, the question of accessibility didn't come up then in full focus. Uh, did adults or people with special needs use the digi digital app? Hard to know. Since then, of course, there have been many improvements in this area as well. 
Uh, we know how the process is built in all the stages in te theory. We start with definition, character characterization, planning, execution, feedback. This is the theory. In life, the challenge is first to define a city and then make it smart for all the residents. I totally agree with this uh, point. We must build value for the residents, for all of them. And I always will return to the definition of who is the resident and what kind of resident and try to hear all their needs as much as possible and the wants. In the field of food, we have, it is customary to make uh, focus groups to taste the food. Uh, in the food, if the food is for everyone, the groups are made for everyone. So let's compare it with smart cities. Smart cities has a lot of topics, energy, lighting, transportation, mobility, buildings, education, health, tourism, all have elements of accessibility. We must hear all the needs and wants for each topic and plan. It's a big, big uh, challenge uh, for the cities. And then one day we had a new visitor in town, a new resident, the COVID-19. Uh, I hope you didn't forget it, it's still with us. Uh, it definitely changed the world orders. Uh, municipalities understand after a tough year that they need both the physical space and the virtual space to be uh, planned for everyone. Uh, suddenly there was a social distance uh, with the dramatic impact of city planning or executing. Suddenly most of the services had to be online and not always to say the least there were accessible uh, for all. Suddenly we need to take care of the population in a different way, uh, to take care of the homeless and give them accessible services uh, inside buildings because it was forbidden to be outside. Uh, in Israel, we are used to stay at home. We have rocket times sometimes uh, we, that we have to stay at home. We have a security department in every each municipality even small town, we have the home front command in the army they, that can supply everything available now and very cheap. The soldiers are very cheap here. We have uh, shelters, sirens every 500 meters. Uh, we are a, a, a very open society sharing personal information very easily. We have WhatsApp groups for every subject. We have ways with full of uh, users and online information. So this is certainly not the open situation in most of the Western countries. In general, all over the planet, we are in the middle of a big, big culture change with a lot of similar issues uh, to solve now. From the professional point of view, we have three new enormous increases. The increase of the e-commerce, is it available for all? The increase of the logistics by deliveries, also, is it available for all? and the more working from home phenomena. It's a big software, hardware, connectivity challenge that we, we are not talking about yet, but the more working from a home made a, a big, big change that we a lot of countries are, were not uh, prepared for. From so draw one point, last minute. Yes, Thanks. from the city point of view, we are talking about the 15 minutes city where the city ecosystem is built around 15 minute services from home uh, to have a place to live, to work, to rest, to buy, to eat, and to go to the clinic. Uh, many of those include digitalization, for, uh, of, of course, and the COVID-19 accelerated this concept since we were allowed to walk a mile, only a mile or kilometer from home. Now, the catch is that the possible gap between a smart city plus the COVID-19 restrictions in front of the services for all, it's a big not solved uh, uh, solution. Uh, Now, it, the, in general, for health, education, information, purchases, communication, local governments had to increase apps and services so that people with disabilities could enjoy the full range of 15 minutes ecosystem mechanism. Uh, there is a, an issue that it's not always in mind. I'm talking about exercise of uh, all human rights and fundamental freedoms. You will talk about it a little bit. Uh, it's for another webinar. Uh, just to mention that cities, cities might take, uh, must take in consideration many principles like awareness, non-discrimination, full and effective participation, 
and integration in society, equal opportunities, accessibility and affordability, and so on. Uh, Thank remember you, number one, I'm finishing. The more in-depth fine tuning we will make, or the more we will be able to go into details, the more we will use artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, technologies, applications, startups, the more dominant the accessibility uh, component will be. Remember number two, not every city is Tel Aviv, London, uh, Tokyo, Madrid. Not every city has the capacity, the budget, the resources, the possibility, and not even the need that those big uh, cities have. So many and small and medium cities build themselves by the method of uh, trial and error. It's not bad at all, in my opinion, uh, but it might be sometimes uh, very expensive. And remember number two, it comes from the state of the art technology advice coming from the state up, uh, the startup nation. Number one, use mask. Number two, wash your hands. And number three, keep two meter distance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergio. Uh, and now I am very happy and, and, and eager to hear from Richard Streets. Streets, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. He's the uh, COO of the Rue Global USA. Uh, whoever has been following our webinars has heard the word Rue Global many, many times. Great, great partners always the best advice and the best connections uh, to uh, reach these amazing speakers. So Richard is going to share with us accessibility and inclusion from Disney parks to smart cities. That sounds intriguing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Access Cicero, first of all, um, and Michelle and Yuval for inviting uh, me to speak um, at, at, at this event. Uh, so I will jump right in here. Can we get that? Um, so talk about it is theme park design, theme park resort design, smart cities and accessibility. What's interesting about the idea of that is that from the theme park industry and especially specifically um, uh, my perspective as, as a Walt Disney Imagineer um, for many, many years, uh, having designed many attractions and theme parks. In the process of going through that, ultimately, uh, we were building smart cities. Um, and so, you know, how can that be, right? Uh, theme parks are, are where you buy popcorn and ride rides, and, and how can that possibly be smart cities? Well, let me show you. Let's look at Walt Disney World. Um, for example, uh, land purchased 19, uh, late 1960s or mid 1960s. Um, you'll see uh, that that map that's on your right is the old original um, property map for Walt Disney World in Florida, in Orlando, Florida. Um, you will see on the uh, on the right a 2020 property map. Um, and uh, the size of the property is 43 square miles, um, which is roughly the size of San Francisco and twice the size of Manhattan. Um, so from a just geography standpoint, um, it, it really is a, a city. And when you dig into the numbers, 58 million um, annual guests uh, go through the property. Um, uh, a, there are 70,000 uh, cast members or employees that are on site, making it the single largest uh, single site employer. Um, there are, you know, uh, the, the fleet of buses to move 250,000 guests go on and off the property on a daily basis, uh, fleets of 400 buses, many, many um, other uh, um, transportation devices, the, you know, uh, power consumption it has its own power plants on it, uh, uh, water treatment plants, sewer. Uh, the, the point being that um, in creating these uh, environments, these rich um, immersive environments, the the technology and the um, the systems necessary to make them all run um, is, is hypercritical. And that was true from day one when um, Magic Kingdom opened in 1972. And so building up from then to now, as technology has improved and, 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 um, and advancements happened, all of that was slowly incorporated in incrementally. And, and I think that's something that's really profoundly important as we look at the model of smart cities themselves. Um, 
Smart cities, of course, is, and, and there's many people that are going to be talking about this. So I'm, I'm just going to, as just a matter of fact, these are the typical systems that uh, people talk about when they talk about smart cities, um, you know, wayfinding, transportation, um, housing, recreation, um, infrastructure, power, water, waste management, safety, security. These are all major components and subsystems that would be necessary to make, quote unquote, a city smart. And again, the many, many definitions that exist out there of, of that. Um, that's all comes into play and is part of a, uh, a, a theme park, a major theme park resort. And uh, I'm going to relay, of course, my Disney experiences as Imagineer as I went through the process. We approach it slightly different than a lot of other organizations do in how they incorporate um, uh, accessibility inclusion into the process. Uh, when, when we approach a project, um, there's two sort of cycles that happen simultaneously. Uh, there's the, uh, the original idea, the concept, um, and that enters into a cycle. You see um, represented here by the dreamer, the realist, and the critic. Um, oftentimes individual people, sometimes it's the same person wearing different hats going through the process. But the idea, which sits in the center there, is, is constant, and this is constantly cycling. The idea is always being reanalyzed, revisited, checked, rechecked. Um, and this is important as it goes to the, through the project life cycle. So as you see here in the blue sky and then concept development, design and construction, ultimately to the, to the opening day and then turnover to operations and so forth. At each one of these steps, this process is constantly, the, the, the idea or the concept is constantly going through this revisional process in each one of the steps because it's incremental as, as, as the main concept and idea travels from one um, area, area to another, it um, it's gets modified slightly, it gets altered. Uh, and so what's key about that is that in a more traditional model, especially when it comes to accessibility and inclusion, there are major milestones in the, in the project schedule that say, at this point, we're going we're gonna to look at, at uh, compliance and, and make sure that we are up to code and so forth, as opposed to doing it day in and day out continuously through the entire process, um, through every discussion. And that's what we did as we were designing and laying out parks, rides and attractions, shops, restaurants, it, it didn't matter, the process was the same, is that we always looked at what was the absolute best benefit that we can provide the end user. And this goes to the idea that uh, the concept that some have mentioned already, about being a human centric, a human centric design, as opposed to a tech driven. Um, Tech is leveraged through the design process. Uh, it's not tech driven. Um, what drives the process should always be the end user experience. What is the consumer, the, the, the guest, the, 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 um, the product user, the service um, um, uh, benefactor? What are they all getting out of the process? Um, and that's what's really sort of key. Um, it's very easy in the beginning to sort of dismiss ideas uh, as being too far-fetched, um, impractical, what have you. Um, but a quote in the bottom that I, that I use oftentimes is never extinguish the spark of creativity or an initiative. Uh, we should always find ways to nourish and fan the flames of inspiration into innovation. I think it's key that we always try to do that um, because the ways that we go about solving many accessibility and inclusion um, um, issues comes from being uh, 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 being creative and how do you approach the problem. And sometimes that can come from the most unlikely uh, sources. Here we have an example, you know, that seamless integration is key. Here's an example, you have entry onto three rides, uh, the Dumbo ride, many people are familiar with a teacup ride here, and this is the small, uh, small world boats. Um, all wheelchair, um, access, but access in different ways where the individual can either do it themselves, have assistance, um, or, um, or, or, or wheel on to themselves uh, dealing with that transfer. Uh, what's key is to make the experience of getting onto a ride not that big a deal or as complicated as anyone else. Uh, one of the one of the great um, difficulties in for a family that's traveling and, and, and entering into these rich immersive environments is the fact that every at every moment they're constantly reminded that you know some rides have to shut down as as it, a person gets on and it and it can be very personally disruptive to the individuals. I'm not saying that just off the top these are from 
thousands of, of, um, of inputs and reports and feedback that we've gotten in the parks themselves from, from uh, actual individuals. Um, and so we make every effort to try to make that process as seamless as possible. Um, so how do we do that? What, what's the practical application of, of all of this? One of the ways that we make our environments really rich and immersive um, is, is going through what I like to think of, uh, think inclusive with sense. Um, we, we really pay attention and go through the, the uh, detailed process of thinking every, everything um, uh, to how it's enjoyed, how it's, what, what's, the, um, what's the value that the individual is getting out of it. Is the entertainment value the same for all individuals. We want to make that experience this, uh, as comparable as possible. And so what we do is we, we make sure that the, the individuals with heightened senses have that benefit. Pavement, for example, is one way. We make tremendous use of different paving models uh, so that uh, as an individual is walking, they may not they may have low vision or, 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 um, or no vision. And but, but they can sense that the ground below them is shifting and that tells them that they're in a different area and that there's a different experience that's happening. And those are, are consistent with all the different areas so that they can have some levels of familiarity with it. Um, that may not necessarily be immediately noticeable to all people, but to some that, that are, are sensitive to that, they absolutely will. Smell, same thing. Um, the, the parks, we make tremendous use of, of smells in, in specifically being... Um, uh, based to areas, um, whether the merchandise shops, uh, area development areas, uh, different lands, and so forth. So the incorporation of, of all of these multi-senses um, is, is absolutely key in, in the process. Sound. Um, the sounds that you hear aren't necessarily as random as you think. All of these are, are designed and, and geared toward helping drive people through the park and in a way that's organized. One of the things that's really key about what we do in the parks is, is people management, um, getting individuals to be spread throughout the park as opposed to all bunched up in one or two or three areas. I know it may seem that way at times, but actually there's a tremendous amount of effort to make sure that that doesn't happen. One of the greatest examples of that for those that uh, have had the opportunity to visit parks is often parades that happen at some point in the middle of the day where a good half of the population of the park, which can be anywhere from 12, uh, uh, 10 to 15,000 people will all bunch up along the main street or along a parade route corridor. The parade will happen and then immediately dispersed. And within minutes, you have 10,000, 10 to 15,000 people that are dispersed in minutes. This is all done by a lot of these methods. Um, and, and what's important about that is that it's a, uh, it's a shared experience for all individuals of all varying abilities and all varying age groups. And that is something that we, again, are very concerned consistent about as we go through the design process. So sound is one of those ways that we can help and guide and lead people through, um, through the park. Um, motion, certainly another, another way that we have a shared experience. Um, you know, if people can go on a, on a roller coaster or go on any of the rides and you get a visual experience, but if you don't have that ability, you still get the benefit of, of, of motion, of, of, um, of, of, uh, of, of temperature, of smells and so forth that are around going through the attraction that provide that same equal based um, uh, experience. Again, gearing toward being a human centric design. Um, visuals, of course, is, is the uh, last sense. Um, obviously very, very important, uh, especially in, in, a, in a theme park environment. Now I'm talking within the, 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 the basis of a theme park, but these apply to all business sectors, whether it's a factory, um, whether it's a product that's being designed. What's important is that through the every step of the process on a day and day basis, the idea and the concept of thinking about how, um, how a person that may not be able to see, how are they gonna engage with this? As opposed to looking at that aspect at a particular point down the, the development stage of the process, every day you're looking at that. Every day you're thinking about that. It's, it's, it's in the forefront. And this was something that was unique that I found unique when I was working at Disney is that it was just into the DNA. We weren't thinking about compliance or, or, or codes at, at that level. I mean, obviously, from a pragmatic sense and a legal standpoint, those, those had to be followed and, and, and laws were met. But <clears throat> but from the design standpoint, we were looking at, at things as to what is the end user experience. 
Um, the last, you know, these the last experiences, of course, are are all of these put together in a single rides, attractions, and so forth. And and you know, this is uh, this particular attraction is a Bug's Life. It's one of my attractions um, that uh, that we incorporated. Um, uh, you know, light, sound, sense, heat, um, uh, and and physical. Uh, we had uh, t- what we call ticklers that uh, that tickle the neck and the back of the ankles, um, the back of the calves, as well as what we called uh, butt bumps of uh, that would that would uh, had little um, uh, bumps that would come up out of the seats um, and actuate. So it was a really immersive environment. So even though you may not necessarily hear or you may not necessarily see, you still had a multi-sensory engaging experience that helped guide you through the particular story of this attraction. Um, and, that, and that's the, the, as I'm coming to a close here, that's one of the key things that's so important is the story. When you're coming up with an idea, whether it's a product, a service, what have you, what is the engaging story that's behind it? Because without that, you're not going to be able to, um, to, to ultimately engage and, and, and keep engaged uh, the individual to which the product or service is geared toward. So what is the story behind the idea? Maintain a dialogue through the life cycle of the steps that naturally includes accessibility and inclusion as part of the ongoing process. It's so important that that happens continuously, day to day in every conversation. Always be challenging oneself for that. Uh, what's the objective for the user? Another thing that's really important is realizing that it's not only just the front end user, right? There's the back end user. There's the people. There's the maintenance groups. There's the individuals that are maintaining the software. There's the individuals that are maintaining the databases behind there. Are those accessible? Um, make sure because of, of, as individuals have said, the, the universe that we live in now is a, as we're heading toward a post-COVID world, um, the employment base is going to be very different. There's going to be people working from all over remotely, from all over the world, with all leveling abilities. So it's important that we have individuals, not only just the 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 users that are on the front end getting the benefit, but also the back end users that are maintaining and 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 developing and and, and um, sustaining uh, whatever those product services are. It's important that all of that is accessible. And so as you go through that design process, you have that dialogue and you keep everyone. Um, uh, uh, you keep everyone engaged into how we can make it better. How can we make it more accessible? Um, Richard, closing statement, even though I want you to continue speaking for at least. Uh, I, 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 I tried to keep it all compressed. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is actually the last statement. Um, uh, is there the, the last important thing <clears throat> to remember is that is there a need to adjust? This is a, a, a part that is often lacking in many uh, smart cities and, and the development is the sustainability aspect of it. Once we build an attraction, the very next day, the first day it's open, we're already asking people, what do they think about it? And that is a day-to-day con- constant feedback loop that is so critically important because as many people have, uh, as speakers have said already before, I mean, we'll probably say the rest of the day, is, is the sustainability of it. You can have the best design in the world, but it's going to be, it's, at some point, it's going to be out of date or people are going to lose, in, lose interest with it because things change. It's important to have that, that live feedback loop that lets uh, individuals be engaged and, and, and lets you stay on top of it so that you know you're always providing the best possible services to the users and to the clients. Um, the last statement, when we can overcome our own initial biases, only then can we achieve true advancement to a more universally inclusive global society. And that's Thank the end. You. My name is Richard Streitz, and I'm with Rue Global. Thank you. And by the way, whoever wants, because I see her questions and I'm receiving uh, messages, any one of our speakers, our amazing speakers up till now, um, uh, you should find their deep contact information in the global uh, website. Um, uh, with a presentation and you can connect. The whole idea of this uh, network is their ripple effect to continue and to continue the, the connections and the uh, advancements together. Uh, so please feel free um, uh, to use the chat now, but contact later. And it's, of course, if you let us know, that makes us feel good. Our next speaker, um, Megan Goddard, uh, Accessibility Senior Program Manager, Accessibility Engineering at Google USA. Uh, Megan, we are I'm just, eager um, to hear you. I'm pretty new at Zoom. I usually use Google Meets. So just give me just a second to get my um, presentation queued up here. No problem. Hello. You see down on the bit below the, the share screen. Yeah. Can you see this? Yeah, now just turn it into a view that is a slideshow. All right. All good? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Megan Goddard, and I've been with Google for almost 15 years. My background is actually in um, maps, but I've been working with accessibility um, for the, the last three and a half years. Um, just to describe myself, um, I have long blonde hair. I look a little sleepy because I'm in California and the sun just came up. Um, I'm looking out at the, the dawn sky over here. Um, and I do work in the uh, Mountain View uh, headquarters when we're actually in the office. Um, I'm wearing a green sweatshirt with our accessibility logo on it. And this is actually one of my favorite colors. Um, I'm sorry, does someone say something? Hold on, we're putting on mute. Sorry, you can continue. Okay. <laughs> um, so you can see behind me that I actually have a pair of crutches leaned up um, on the wall behind me. Um, I had an accident this weekend. I was hiking after I got my vaccination. I went out to celebrate for a little hike and I fell down a hill um, and I twisted my ankle and my knee. And so I'm on crutches. Um, hopefully it won't be long-term, but it just goes to show that at some point in our lives, you know, we do experience different situational, um, even if it's short-term disabilities. Um, it's been an interesting weekend trying to kind of hobble around my house. I've learned that I can roll myself around in my desk chair. Um, bringing coffee to the table here was kind of complicated this morning, but it really does make me think a little bit more about uh, mobility. Um, today, I just want to talk a little bit about Google's mission and how accessibility fits into that. And then I'm actually not an expert on smart cities, and I decided to focus in a little bit on maps and accessibility and some of the features that Google is working on. So as you all know, you may have seen this mission. Our mission at Google is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. We want everyone to be able to use any product that Google creates. So I manage a team that we work all across Google. Um, we're on a central team. We work all across Google to make sure that all of our products are compliant with WCAG um, and that they're usable. Um, the other exciting thing about Google is there's so many passionate people at Google who really want to create a better world for everybody. And so in addition to making our products accessible, we also work on special features built in and baked into our um, everyday sort of platforms that are very useful for people with different disabilities. Um, so one of those that um, I work on the central accessibility team, this is just an example of one of the products that we created to help people who uh, may not be able to see everything around them. It's called Lookout. Um, it's an application you can download to your phone and it reads out things in front of you. Um, and it's really useful to see what's around you in the world. It's also very useful for navigation. I did try it out last night on my cat and it did actually identify that it was a cat and spoke back to me and it said that there was a cat in front of me. Um, so these are just some of the interesting tools that Google creates um, for, for people with different disabilities. Um, I did um, add a YouTube link here. If you're ever interested in learning more, you can search for it or you can assess this, um, this, this presentation. So like I said, my background is actually in maps. Um, I started at Google working for Google Maps and Google Earth. And currently now I'm off of the, the GEO team, but I still work heavily with GEO. Um, to make these accessible features. One of the things that we created a couple years ago and launched, um, and you may have heard about it, is accessible transit maps. And this is just amazing to me that we can use this platform and create these tools for people to access. Um, and, and this particular tool, it'll map out a route for you if you happen to be on crutches or you have a stroller or you're in a wheelchair and you need a little extra help. Um, and so this tool, sucks in all the transit data. This is a map of uh, New York um, showing these different routes that you can take that make it a little bit easier for you to get around with public transportation. Um, and the way that you can access that is if you go into the transit options on Google Maps, you can actually set it for wheelchair accessible. Um, we're adding in more and more data for more cities across the world. And I think that, you know, smart cities is, is um, like I said, a fairly new concept for me, um, but it, I think that data is really important piece of this. Um, and I, I know that there's some speakers who are gonna be speaking later on about accessible transit. Um, and for me, maps are so important um, for a city. Um, another thing I wanna show everybody that is kind of sometimes kind of hard to find in Google Maps are um, accessible attributes. So as you know, Google Maps, I'm showing a map of um, my hometown of Aptos. 
um, there's a restaurant there called Manuel's Mexican restaurant. They used to have a bathroom that you actually had to go up three stairs, but they called it wheelchair accessible. Um, and somebody pointed out that that's maybe not quite wheelchair accessible. And this, this restaurant actually took off the accessibility information on their place mark until they were able to build a new bathroom at the front of the, the restaurant. And then they updated this information. So you can go click on these place marks and you can actually look at the accessible information, um, which makes it easier if you're trying to plan a trip someplace. Um, and so again, just with maps, I work a lot with um, local governments as well. We had a series of fires this, this year. Um, the city created maps that were red for, for the bad zones, evacuation zones, and then green for the good zones. And I pointed out that that's actually really hard for somebody who's um, colorblind to see. And so they went in and updated those, those maps. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to show just a couple different features and tell you a few stories. Um, I'm always available if, if anybody would ever like to reach out to me or have ideas and have further discussion, I'm always here. And that's it, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Megan. Now I was on mute. Um, uh, definitely uh, fascinating. Um, and uh, I can tell you that here in Israel, there is a requirement by law that every uh, uh, service provider publishes on the website the details of what is accessible uh, uh, in their uh, shop or in their restaurant. So to put that on the Google map, as you described, should be uh, a great uh, uh, thing. So our next speaker, uh, Yael Shomron, she is the global marketing manager from Step Here Israel. And uh, Step Here has many um, amazing uh, um, uh, technologies and, and, uh, and uh, solutions. Uh, she will talk about Smart Step for Smart Cities. Please, Yael. Hello, um, I will share my screen just a minute. Uh, meanwhile, I will uh, tell you that I am a white female with brownish hair, straight hair. Uh, just a minute, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see my uh, presentation now? Yes, we can just turn it into screen view, a, a slide view. I will, I am. Okay. I hope you see now uh, the first- we see, uh, we see your next um, uh, slide, but never mind. Uh, I know that uh, there's some problems with that, but this is- Yeah, fine. with Zoom. Okay. So uh, we are step here. We are a technological uh, company dealing with accessibility. Uh, actually, we develop our uh, hardware and software and application uh, for accessibility. And it's uh, not by chance, we are part of a bigger company called Mehalev, which is a, a leading company in Israel for accessibility for the last 23 years. And today I will talk about our solutions and step here, uh, smart step for smart cities. And we are trying to uh, address some challenges for people with disabilities in the urban environment uh, to be uh, able to move around actually in public places and public transportation with independence, dignity and safety. Uh, independence being uh, mostly not to be dependent on others in order to go out of the home and go about places and get services. Uh, dignity could mean many things, but we're addressing especially not to have to ask uh, other people for assistance to be more independent. And safety, uh, we deal uh, mostly with people with uh, blindness or visually impaired people uh, that are many times a danger in places like the street or a, a ramp out platform or crosswalks. And uh, during COVID-19, uh, everything is enhanced, the need for independence uh, because people uh, try to avoid a, a close uh, touch with uh, strangers. Uh, so uh, what are the smart steps in the smart city? We are trying to remove barriers uh, from the moment uh, a person and, uh, exits their home uh, through junctions and crosswalks and pedestrian traffic lights. Uh, 
um, bus and tram stops or train stations uh, on the vehicle itself, on the bus, on the train, and in uh, outside and inside buildings. It could be an office building, a, a commercial building, or a public building. So uh, we had an evolution in our technology. We started as a wayfinding by audio guidance, uh, mostly for people uh, with blindness or visually impaired. We continued uh, with assistance by IoT, by Internet of Things, uh, to overcome some challenges in the everyday life. Uh, it also uh, expanded to people with mobility disability. And Today, we are dealing also with a smart interactive system for public transportation. So we are even expanding more and more. It could be uh, different uh, populations that have uh, some uh, trouble using public transportation. Uh, Sean, maybe you can show our short film, two minute film. Uh, this is what we... <laughs> me and Sharon were talking about that she will show the, our film because of the uh, Zoom uh, technology. Is that possible? In the world today, more than 1.3 billion people with disabilities. Picture... Can you share it, please? But I, I, I will stop my sharing. John, should I stop my sharing? Yes. Message sent. Today, there are more than 1.3 billion people with disabilities. Picture a single, simple technological solution which could provide solutions for a wide variety of needs. Accessible environments, establishments, tourism, and accessible public transportation. To your left. Using new technological means and harnessing IoT and big data, we can make things accessible in a major way with only minor effort. Voice guidance in open urban environments such as the beaches in Tel Aviv and Herzliya. A smart app provides information about nearby public transportation and provides the option to send a request for assistance to the driver. The bus will arrive in three minutes. Message sent to driver. Step here is a holiday for people with disabilities. Voice guidance for establishments such as banks, schools, the hospitals, and stores. The fruit display is to your left. Indoor and outdoor voice guidance in hotels, museums, and tourist sites. Welcome. The elevator is to your right. You are on the 11th floor. In front of you is the gymnasium. To your right are rooms 1110 through 1120. For you, it's a gadget. For me, it's life-changing. Stepir has the best audio guiding technology for visually impaired people. The speaker in the audio sign is essential. It indicates to the user exactly where to stand so that the guidance is the most accurate. Step here, a smart voice assistant designed for orientation. Okay, I will renew the screen sharing. Just a minute. Can you see the presentation now? Yes. Yes, we okay. can. Fine. So um, actually, uh, we have our Step Here app, which is a one stop for accessibility for connecting with various devices for uh, multiple features. 
and um, we also have a risk activator if uh, someone is not using the uh, applications. And uh, the three uh, sectors that we're dealing with, like I said before, accurate wayfinding, assistance with IoT, which could be also like you saw in the video, uh, opening even a, a coded door or electric gate just by opening the app without uh, having to touch the panel or to find it, uh, which is difficult for a person with a, a vision disability. So in COVID-19, these things are even much more important. And uh, what we call Step Here Orban, which is uh, our system for public transportation and for pedestrian traffic lights, I will try to expand just a little bit. Uh, step here guide, uh, the wayfinding, uh, indoors and outdoors for people with blindness or visual impairment. Uh, in this case, the app uh, is communicating with what we call an audio sign, our device. It's actually a smart loudspeaker that has several recordings automatically activated by the app. The, the communication uh, is Bluetooth and uh, or the personal wrist activator. And uh, the user has the choice to hear the, the audio guidance from the audio sign or from the phone, from the smartphone. And just a quick word, why is audio sign essential for people with blindness or visual impairment and wayfinding? Uh, since uh, we're using Bluetooth, which is, uh, has a more accuracy than GPS, but still it's uh, around 20 uh, or 10 meters uh, accuracy. So uh, if the guidance would be only from the smartphone, it could be a little bit misleading because we don't know and the user doesn't know where he is. So external sound uh, we found is essential. First of all, anchoring uh, the user uh, to know exact an exact location, like an entrance door in a wide facade of a building or a bus stop on the sidewalk. Uh, secondly, it indicates to the user where to stand right next to the audio sign. So from there, uh, the audio guidance is correct and most accurate. Um, and we have a step here, a guide and assistant uh, devices implemented today in thousands of uh, places, mostly in Israel, but also around the world, places like universities, malls, retail outlets, banks, uh, municipalities, etc. And I would like to elaborate a little bit more about the smart system uh, for public transportation because it's quite unique. It not only helps at the stop or the platform uh, or the station or on the vehicle, but also has connectivity to the vehicle while the user is standing in a bus stop or a tram stop or a platform. Uh, so we are trying to solve uh, some barriers in public transportation. I will give some examples from the bus system. Uh, first of all, for persons with blindness or visual impairment, just to find and identify the bus stop on the sidewalk, sometimes it's difficult. So our audio sign at the bus stop or the tram stop uh, automatically activated when the user is close by is very helpful. Uh, also, uh, we provide live audio information of the lines uh, arriving and the next time of arrival. And what is really special and really essential is uh, uh, if we look at the left side, uh, what is the problem? Uh, people with blindness many times tell us that uh, they're frustrated just from sitting in a tram stop or a bus stop and missing the bus because there's many lines. And by the time they try to find out which line arrived, uh, the bus is already gone, and also the driver doesn't always recognize them uh, to give them the special uh, assistance. So what uh, Step Here does, the application, uh, just by pressing one button in the application, sends an indication to the relevant driver, to the relevant line that the user is interested in, that a person with disability or a person who needs special assistance is waiting at the next stop so that bus driver and the, the user uh, don't miss each other, which is extremely important. And also the user gets audio push alert uh, that his bus is arriving two minutes before it arrives. And on the bus itself, uh, also uh, he's able to indicate to the driver when he wants to get off just by pressing a button in the app. He doesn't have to look for a 
a physical button uh, in the bus uh, to try to find where it is. Uh, this is for people with uh, visual impairment. And also uh, we found out that people that have mobility disability also uh, find it very useful uh, to let the bus driver know that uh, they are waiting for him for, and also uh, to get an alert, to get ready. And we get also a good uh, feedback from the drivers themselves because they want to give the service and this helps them uh, give the best service. Closing statement, Yaeli, please. Thank you. All righty. Okay, <laughs> we are implemented uh, in the bus system in Israel in, in a project for two years, expecting to expand. Uh, we're also now implementing in the uh, tram cars of the uh, CAF uh, manufacturers in Spain. Uh, that are going to arrive to uh, the light rail in Jerusalem uh, in the end of this year. And um, we hope to do more and more with technology in the smart city. Perfect. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, and I definitely uh, can, can uh, testify that when I see reactions of blind people here in Israel using this, it does the job. So uh, good luck on uh, spreading the word. Our next speaker um, is our dear friend from ONCE. I can never say, pronounce it correctly. Excuse me, Jose. Uh, Jose Luis Boro Jordan, head of the Department of Accessibility to the Physical Environment in ONCE, Spain. And he's going to talk about smart human city concept. Jose, please. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you so much for the presentation, Michal. You pronounced it great. Well, you can tell me Borau, Bugo, well, it's, it's more French, but it's, it's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much to Access Israel to, for inviting us, uh, Fundacion Once, to be here sharing with you this concept of uh, smart human city. Well, first of all, I want to, to present myself. I think I've never done that with, uh, since I was at the school, but and so it's quite difficult. So I'm going to try it. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a really, really, handsome guy you know with a white haired bird well it was only a joke okay the only truth is i have a, a white bird okay i'm wearing a, a white t-shirt and a, a black vest okay on my back i have i have the logo of, of fundacion once you know once as michael said once many of you i i suppose you you know you know us on is the national organization for the blind people here in spain and that created in 1938, let me uh, share with you the presentation, uh, on the foundation where I work, okay? In order to improve improve the life of people with disability. Can you, can you see my, my, my screen? Yes, okay. So, yes. we were, uh, as I told, uh, we, we were working uh, since 1988 uh, in order to improve the quality of life of people with disability here in Spain, but also in the abroad Spain. Okay, not only for, for, for blind people, but also for all people with disabilities. So uh, we're going to talk about, about cities. Okay, but so, and when we started to work with Inserso, Inserso is, a, is, a, is a, um, a statement of the Spanish government that takes care about uh, the needs of people with disability, uh, also uh, and the needs of elderly people. We 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 we, are, we make an agreement with with Inserso in order that well in order to improve the accessibility in in, all, in many cities here in Spain. In a moment, I I, I, I am talking about that we started that agreement in in the early 90s in 1990. So. We were working in more than eight eight hundred towns uh, and city councils that were ben uh, beneficiaries of, of this project in order to 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 develop accessibility in many cities. So we were talking uh, thirty years ago. Okay, so we were trying to 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 get accessibility in many in many cities. Um, we have many uh, agreements with several corporations, great companies in Spain, many public administrations, universities, and the most important disability organizations. Uh, all these um, companies are, are, are working all in cities. They are developing many projects, different projects in cities. You can see Samsung, Renfe, 
uh, well, there are many, many companies and many um, entities uh, working in cities. And with, uh, we, we have a, 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 main, a main objective here in, in on the foundation that is work together with universities in order to, to include accessibility in the in the study programs, okay, for the for the for the professionals that we will be creating, that will be defining the the cities in the future, okay. Of course, we are developing uh, innovation projects in order to find new solutions, in order to improve the quality of life of people with disability. So that those are many things that we have been doing before the, the concept of the, the smart city concept appeared in our lives. I don't know how many, how many years some, any, uh, some, somebody pronounced for the first time the, the word smart city, but we were doing that. And, uh, and all that we, we were working on uh, 33 years ago, uh, I think that it's, it's, it's really related with the, with the city city development with the smart city development and the, the smart city concept because almost an 80 percent of the european citizens live in cities in 2050 uh, almost 70 percent of the population all around the world will be living in cities uh, and cities have been uh, have developed into cultural politics social and economic exchange centers depending on them the rest of municip municipalities and towns and one of the greatest changes faced by the cities on the rain to be innovative is the necessity of a design that includes all its inhabitants and visitor requirements, taking into account their different ages, genders, functional capabilities, cultural levels, origin country, etc. Especially to achieve the guarantee that all those who live in a risk situation will fully enjoy the rights and will take part equally on the economic, social and cultural events. Other major challenge related to the exclusion risk is the importance of providing the same services to all the inhabitants for any mun municipality, despite of its number, because of the links with reference cities. So cities and towns innovation has potential to improve the inhabitants' life quality, increase the public service efficiency, reducing at the same time the cost. Ultimately, cities would become into industry trading and tourism poles of attractions. The smart city traditional concept and implementation of the services based on it is not enough. Developing strategies to get inclusion for all the citizens and avoid the differences among them is essential. So a smart human city, a smart human city is a concept that Fundación Once created many years ago. Uh, and we, we call a smart human city uh, to a city that takes advantage from innovation developments in order to foster and encourage the social inclusion, takes action and intervenes on the public buildings and services, means of, means of transport and mobility, ICTs, with the aim of getting installation equally usable for everybody and with the finest efficiency and interactivity. So a smart human city defines the urban area with the appropriate infrastructure, networks, and intelligent pl platforms, creating an environment able to listen and, and understand whatever is happening on it, and consequently to take better decisions and provide the correct information and services to the citizens using advanced analytical techniques and inclusive interfaces. The concept uh, why, by which an inclusive and smart city is sustained are the equality and flexibility to access and use the provided services, both in a traditional or technological way. The ICTs may play a key role to improve the service quality and guarantee an adequate attention to everybody, particularly to those who have specific requirements that if stay unknown and, and unattended can lead to exclusion risk situations. An inclusive smart city, a smart human city, must take into account the universal accessibility concept, strictly understood as the condition that has to be met by environments, processes, goods, products, and services, as well as objects, instruments, tools, and devices to be understandable, usable, and practical by everybody in security and comfort conditions at the most autonomous and natural way. So, which benefits, which benefits gets uh, a city when, when it becomes uh, a smart human city? 
Well, you can see in the in the slide, innovation enhancement and technology transfer, particularly social innovation and those applications at the service of the citizens, accessibility and quality improvement of the urban public services ICT applications. Uh, for the small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, well, it, it will uh, arise competitiveness improvements thanks to the development of new opportunities and new business models environment protection and resource efficiency, considering the energy efficiency and clean energies in urban areas, sustainable urban mobility and to eliminate bottlenecks in, in important infrastructures, employment, of course, social inclusion and fight against poverty and education abilities and continuous training. So a smart human city project provides a, a holistic vision of the city that will be developed uh, by the public services according to priorities, placing the people needs at the center of every action that is carried. So, and the goals, the goals of the of the um, of, of a smart human city, well, to design a new a new city concept, including everybody on it, and promoting its competitiveness and as tourism business a life place, uh, to develop new services for all, both private and public fostering the creation of new services, enterprises, and employment based on ICTs, accessible ICTs. Uh, another goal is to adapt the existing infrastructures for all, including housing, means of transport, work environment, education, culture, and person, a more efficient energy use, to promote all these projects through the entrepreneurship, and to enable those groups of people in exclusion risk to be citizens in their own right. So, and the main action for smart human city are not different that um, that other kind of cities that are not called uh, a smart or a smart human cities. But of course, there are, uh, some of these main action areas are inclusive and smart city planning. Uh, of course, developing projects, uh, referring infrastructures, and innovative innovative service services. For example, intelligent traffic lights, signing projects, uh, emergency professional assistance services, services and medical follow-up platforms. Well, many of of the of the projects of the of the solution that are going to be shared today in this webinar, and of course, integration training and awareness in order to 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 get all the all the staff in the in the cities to be uh, a word about accessibility and, uh, and about uh, design for all. Jose, if you and could just two conclusions. closing remarks. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm closing right now. So I just I just want to say just two, 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 two concepts, OK? Uh, of course, Smart Human City will take into account not only technological dimensions, because physical accessibility is essential, OK? Don't, I don't want to. Uh, we, I, I always try to avoid uh, people thinking about the smart city all, you know, with drones or many, many sensors all around the city. But okay, and a smart city always will be uh, that one that get focus. Uh, is, is always focusing in the, in the in the people living there. Uh, that is always taking into account the needs of people with, of of all the people, and and as and a city that doesn't take into account the, the needs of all the citizens that are living there, of course, it, will, it won't be able to, to be um, a smart city. I think it, it shouldn't be called a city, okay? Maybe it could be, it, it could be called a, a silly, a foolish city, but so I think we have to, to push, let's bet on cities for citizens, let's build a smart human cities. Thank, Thank you so much you. for your Thank attention. You. Thank you very, very much. We definitely have a lot to learn here. Uh, appreciate you uh, joining us. Now, our next speaker, we're doing a small change now um, um, due to um, uh, a little delay we have. Our next speaker is going to be Yovav Meidad, Chief Growth and Marketing Manager from MoveIt. Uh, Israel. He will talk about making cities accessible for all. Ed will be following him right away. Yes, Yovav, please. Hi, everyone. Can you see my slide deck? Yes, we can. Excellent. So great to be here speaking with you about how we at MoveIt make cities accessible. Um, 
those of you who are not familiar with Mubit, so um, we're about 10 years old company. About a year ago, we were acquired by Intel. And what we do is we offer mobility as a service solutions, as well as uh, offering for free the world's most popular urban mobility app. Um, in a way, we have two set types of customers. For the users, for the consumers, for the citizens, the Movit app that you can see on the left has all the information that users need in order to get to the, the, their destination in the most convenient way. And it has grown, as I said, to be the world's number one urban mobility app. And to cities, governments, transit agencies, whether they're public or private, we offer a set of mass services, uh, mobility as a service services, that are powered by AI, big data, and analytics, we basically leverage billions of data points that we collect through the Movit app, and we build solutions that help cities, governments, and agencies address their mobility needs. Um, the Movit app itself, or white label apps that we built using the same engine, combine all the information about different transit, public transit, and shared transit, including micromobility. As you can see here, it includes real-time arrivals, journey planning, service alerts, and more. And it creates multimodal trips, meaning it combines all these options together. It has grown to be used by almost 1 billion users now in more than 3,400 cities across 112 countries and we support 45 languages. In terms of the accessibility features that we've built them, um, we at Moveit from day one believe that mobility is a basic human right of everyone. And in order to help and assist everyone, maximize their potential, maximize their opportunity for employment, for education, for better social life, um, we need to make sure that the app has all the information, including for people with different disability needs. So we've built, already starting from 2015, different capabilities, including uh, features and capabilities for users who are blind and visually impaired, um, for users with head motor impairments, and for users with ambulatory impairments. Uh, for example, calculating wheelchair accessible routes and showing them inside the app itself. Um, as I mentioned, we also offer mass solutions to transit operators, cities, municipalities, campuses, and private sector. And we see huge interest and we get actually a lot of credit for the accessibility capabilities that we built into the product by these type of customers. So, one of the things, what, what I wanted to highlight now in, in the second part of, of my presentation, after you get an overview about Movit, is how did we get to implement those? And I'll start describing the process. And I don't know if there are any app developers on this webinar, but hopefully, if they are, that might be helpful for you guys. How did we go about implementing the uh, voiceover and talkback capabilities for visual impairments users? Uh, it was a long, uh, initially a relatively large effort, but later on, because it became a routine for us with every new feature that we develop, we continue to add the support. Um, we started by a focus group that we, uh, I participated. Uh, it was held actually in Google Campus Tel Aviv back in 2015. And a group of app developers was brought together. We were brought together to meet different users we, who are either blind or had different visual impairments. And that was a very enlightening experience for me personally, because I was able to see firsthand the non-optimized elements on the screen, on the app itself. Um, over there, I committed that within three months, within one quarter, we're going to make a massive improvement and dramatic improvement to our product. And that's what happened. Uh, we, I took notes, learned what was not working right, and then started, it's went back to the office and started to implement some fixes. Um, the first fix was the. Nice. I'll let you hear it for a few seconds. Nice. 
favorites button. So the idea was to ensure the ground tube that heading. the swiping order Absolute. was correct and it elements were not Central. jumping uh, in the wrong Central. swiping order. District. Character mode. Insertion point at start. The second one Text was uh, to exclude non crucial features. Uh, from the swiping order, for example, inside the search function in Movit, users can either type in their destination or choose the map in order to uh, drop a pin. And one of the feedback points that we received from uh, blind users was that this is an essential uh, uh, feature for them. They're going to choose specify the destination by typing an address. So removing the non-crucial features from the swiping order improves the user experience for them. Um, and finally, um, added accessibility labels to every element on the screen, uh, describing clearly cells and elements that when you just look at them, they might make a lot of sense for someone who can uh, see, but there's kind of a paragraph, a story being told when the user sees something like this. Uh, so we wanted to offer clear narrative instead of just nuggets of the just disjoint uh, information. Uh, and the last fix that we did was to add hints uh, that are uh, more descriptive uh, elements that provide additional context to the screens. So the uh, uh, process required to go through each screen of the app. We have about 50 different screens within the app to make sure that each one of them closely follows these guidelines. We, you, we um, par partnered with a number of blind and visually impaired users to actually beta test those capabilities. And that was a very successful process to make Move It accessible for blind and visually impaired users. Another element, another thing that we did was to in, uh, optimize move it for head motor impairments. We uh, audited the app and we implemented a number of fixes based on uh, uh, understanding the this the, that the first of all screens became larger. Users who have to use their phone only with one hand need have limited access to the areas here at the top. So we wanted to make sure that there's enough either space between the targets and also elements appear near the bottom of the screen. And you can see here, how did Move It version four look like? You can see at the top, all the navigational elements in the blue bar, as well as pretty tight cells at the bottom. Uh, in version five, we actually made a complete a, a change here, moving the main navigational controls direction stays, stations in line to the bottom of the screen and ensuring that um, all cells became a lot taller with a bigger uh, hot zone touch area. So that was an, also another improvement to allow users with head motor impairments to use the app more easily. And finally, for users with ambulatory impairments, um, we did a process that involved two steps. First, we received accessibility data for uh, transit stations, transit uh, stations platforms, as well as lines. We also used our community of users to contribute that uh, sort of data in different cities around the world. And then we implemented changes across relevant app screens. So in the journey planner, um, our journey planners can calculate wheelchair accessible routes, and we clearly display them in the what we call the suggested route screen, where users can see all of their options, as well as in the step-by-step -step direction screen. In this nearby stations and station info screen, we clearly label stations that are wheelchair accessible to make sure that people know in advance whether they'll be able to access the platform or not. And in certain cities where this information is available, we also provide for specific lines, the upcoming lines, an indication whether the specific bus that is approaching or the specific train that is approaching is wheelchair accessible or not. All of these capabilities eventually 
make sure that users who travel in a wheelchair or maybe even in a, with, with a, a young family with a baby stroller can plan their trip in advance and get to their destination in the most convenient way. So all of these capabilities are offered in the Move It app. And as I said before, also in our white label solutions and the solutions that we offer to cities. Uh, and we have a number of customers uh, from different cities around the world and different public and private transit agencies that benefit from all of these capabilities in the solution that they get from us. Um, and I invite anyone to learn more and get in touch with us at movie.com slash accessibility. Great. Thank you, Yovav. And, and please make sure to upload the presentation and your contacts in our global website. Sharon will send the information. I'm sure there will be many that would like to hear more from you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Our next speaker is Ed Summers, Director of Accessibility at SAS, uh, SAS Institute from the USA. And he will talk about something that was already raised earlier uh, in this webinar, challenges and solutions for equal access to data. Ed, please, thank you very much. Hi, Michelle, thank you so much. And it is my goal to, to talk about the challenges and solutions with regards to accessible data and do that as fast as possible in less than 10 minutes um, so that we can get back on schedule. Uh, so I am, uh, let's see, I'm a white male. I'm, uh, I have brown hair. I have a black shirt and I have on a brown uh, jacket. And I'm in my home office here, which has uh, pretty bland walls, I suppose, behind me. Um, I'm also blind uh, and I've been working in the field of data, statistics, uh, analytics, and AI for oh, 25 years now. And for the last 10 years, I focused specifically on the accessibility of data uh, for people with disabilities. So this presentation is primarily geared toward those of you who want to use data in an accessible way uh, for your smart city. Let me share my screen and start my presentation. Great, it's okay. 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 So for the purposes of this presentation, I developed it basically trying to put my, in a very user-centric way, if I were uh, working on the accessibility and, and making a, a city inclusive and accessible, how would I tackle the problem of data to ensure that people of all abilities get access to the data uh, from my city? So uh, I wanted to cover three uh, solutions. Uh, first is raw data. And this is the foundation, I think, of an accessible data strategy. And then we'll talk about the presentation of data in tables. And of course, data visualizations, which um, one of the obvious challenges for, for data visualization is, of course, non-visual access to uh, those data visualizations for people with visual impairments or blindness. So raw data. Raw data, I think, is the foundation of, of, your, of a accessible data strategy. It should be the foundation. Uh, and I'll just give a couple of example formats here of, of raw data, you know, uh, CSV. Uh, sometimes I see uh, data published, raw data published as uh, in an XLS, uh, an Excel spreadsheet, dot XLSX. Um, and then, you know, there's all kinds of custom formats. So for example, for geo, KML or keyhole map language is a common uh, data format that is used to uh, share data that is geotagged. So of course, there's probably hundreds if not thousands of data formats out there that we could list here, but those are just a few examples. CSV all the way stands for comma separated values. Uh-oh, somehow my, my, uh, I must have hit, hit my mouse button or something there, my slides uh, jump forward. Yeah, okay, raw data is generally accessible. Uh, for people with disabilities. 
uh, in that there are no additional barriers that, input, or that are put in place for people with disabilities versus people without disabilities. Um, I would advise you to always, when possible, when privacy and security uh, concerns aren't, are, aren't an issue, uh, to, to make raw data available either as uh, time, you know, snapshots in time download uh, or as data feeds uh, so that one, uh, it gives you future proof um, access. It, 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 it's, a, it's a future proofing of your accessibility needs. Okay, first and foremost. Um, so rather than if it, let's say there are meeting times for cultural events in your in your city that you're going to publish on your website well if you put that out as a raw data file then people can can take that or third-party developers other applications uh, can take that information and um, and easily make it accessible in a in a wide variety of ways to meet the needs of different people in addition to the raw data of course you might make it make, make that data available as uh, a table or in some other form on your website, and that's fine. Uh, but I would just encourage you always, always, always to think about exposing your data uh, in, a, in a raw data file or a raw data feed uh, so that people can take advantage of it in a variety of ways that you can't, you simply, even though uh, you may have a good handle on how people use your data, you can't anticipate the, the ways that people may benefit from that in the future. Okay, step one, if you remember nothing else, Make your data available as raw data. So uh, tables are another way that we commonly make data available on websites or in applications. And a table is just a kind of a, a tabular format. Um, the first thing you always want to do with tables is, is to include a caption or summary so that people can quickly perceive using a variety of modes. Uh, what the information in the table is, what, what, what is what is being represented in the table. Um, I'm using a screen reader. You may be able to see a little visual um, bounding box on my screen as I read through this slide. People who use screen readers to access content on mobile devices or on websites, we basically we access each individual element within the screen uh, one element at a time. So as I, if I were to navigate a table, then I would, I would navigate each data cell or column header or row header individually. And when I'm navigating those data cells though, it's really important for me to be able to ask my screen reader, what is the column row heading or what is the column heading of this particular cell? And so because you want to facilitate that capability for people who use screen readers and other assistive technologies. And the way you do that is to use the, the technology appropriate method for marking up uh, column headings and row headings. Sometimes we, we, uh, we frequently mark up a use color to indicate um, some significance for particular uh, data cells. For example, red, green, yellow is, is a good example. It's the traffic lighting is what that's called. It's pretty typical um, for, for individual cells based on the data in those cells. That's a wonderful thing to do. Keep doing it. But make sure that you also include some text representation of that red, of those colors, whatever they may mean, uh, so that people who are colorblind can distinguish uh, the, the difference as well. And then lastly, for tables, it is frequent to, uh, we frequently put controls on tables to, to kind of spice them up and make them sortable or add other kinds of capabilities on the table. Um, typically in the column headers, there's, there's uh, interactive controls. If you do that, please make sure that those, those controls can be accessed with both a, uh, the keyboard alone for people with mobility impairments and also using a screen reader for people with visual impairments. So lastly, we'll just talk briefly about data visualization. So data visualizations include charts, graphs, maps, and infographics, just are some examples. I would argue that data visualization is an accessibility technology. It gives the human brain uh, access to information uh, that we couldn't perceive from raw data. So by all means, in, use data visualization. However, when you do, uh, make sure that you, uh, we'll, we'll just cover a few things here that enable primarily non-visual access to the data visualizations. So again, from a color perspective, it is, it is a wonderful thing to use color to indicate meaning inside of data visualizations. So red for this, 
green for that, for example. Okay. But if you do that, remember that red, red green colorblindness, just as one example, is the most common form of colorblindness. So also indicate that meaning in an additional way, something besides color. Uh, it could be shape or text or an icon or badge or, or any of those kinds of things. And that, that enables people who are colorblind to perceive the same information. Um, make sure that you provide a, a text summary of the key takeaways of any data visualization. That, that enables people to plainly read, uh, get the point, the gist of the data visualization for those who have difficulty interpreting it or for people who can't see it. And lastly, the, one of probably the most important things about data visualizations is when you provide them, also provide access to the summarized data within the data visualization as in tabular format. That could be a table, for example, on the same web page as the data visualization. It could be a link to a CSV file, XLSX file, or some raw data feed um, that, that enables people, uh, enable anyone to get access to the summarized and or raw data that underlies the, underlies the data visualization. Great, closing remark. Perfect timing. Oh my goodness, that was, that was wonderful. We are on the same wavelength. Uh, again, my name is Ed Summers. I'm Director of Accessibility at SAS, the market leader in big data and analytics software. And uh, you can reach me at accessibility at sas.com, sas.com. And I uh, would love to hear uh, any questions or comments you have about accessible data. Thank you, Michelle. Perfect. Thank you very, very much. And now, uh, if you can unshare your screen, uh, yes, we will yes, yes. go immediately to our next uh, speaker, who I'm very eager to hear about. Um, uh, New York City is known for many things, uh, one of them definitely uh, their uh, transportation, um, uh, great transportation. So, Kwemel Arroyo, I really hope I'm pronouncing you well. Um, uh, he's the Chief Accessibility Officer at State of New York MTA, Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And he will be talking about New York City Subway Station Lab for Accessible Innovation. Kwemel, I really hope I'm pronouncing it well. Go ahead. Yes, you are. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kwemel Arroyo here from the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, better known as the MTA here in New York City. Uh, we provide public transportation for the state of New York. So we move uh, New Yorkers all throughout the state, not just the city. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen now. I hope this is working and I will go ahead and present. Um, here we go. So I am Kumel Arroyo, the Chief Accessibility Officer for the MTA. And as you can see on the screen, the MTA encompasses really three major transit organizations where we left out tunnels and bridges for this presentation, but the New York City Transit, which comprises of all bus and subways operations here in New York City, the Metro North, which goes upriver uh, to, to other parts of the state and Long Island Railroad out east uh, um, to the island. As some of you might know, uh, um, New York State has a, a, uh, approximately 22% uh, of New Yorkers report a disability here in New York City, about 1 million New Yorkers self-identify as New Yorkers with disabilities. But my population and the demographic that I cover, that I like to talk about, it goes a lot beyond just persons with disabilities because as we've already heard today, accessibility touches a lot more than just people with disabilities. I also like to think about parents with strollers. Here in New York City, we see on average 130,000 births a year. That's 130,000 strollers hitting our streets, our sidewalks, our pavement, and accessing the public transportation system. In addition to that, over 1.5 million New Yorkers are over the age of 65. That's over 1.5 million New Yorkers that, that, though they may not identify as a New Yorker with a disability, they absolutely don't have the same gait that they once used to or vision. So, so I definitely think about those New Yorkers in, in my population demographic, and of course, tourists people who are coming in at JFK and others with luggages and bags that are accessing our transit system, all whom absolutely make use of our accessibility features. For this presentation specifically, we will speak about other initiatives that go beyond the physical accessibility of elevators. New York City has one of the oldest transit systems in the world at 117 years old. So we are absolutely enhancing the accessibility in our, in our network by adding in elevators 
and escalators and stairs. But for today, we'll talk about what I think comprises our, our smart city or the approach that we've taken for uh, building our smart city in, in this particular uh, project, our accessibility lab at J Street Metro Tech. I, for, so, so for this project, we, we really looked at what does a smart city look like? And, and what are the features of a smart city for the New York City transit system at the MTA? And we really looked at uh, uh, how a smart city doesn't leave behind the physical element and, and what physicalities comprise of, of that smart city. So for us, it, it, you, you will see there's a lot of touch, there's a lot of visual, there's a lot of physical assets that make up our smart city and how we are defining what, what smart looks like in our transit systems um, to achieve this, this uh, uh, innovation and, and accessibility lab at this station. We partnered with C2 Smart or Connected Cities with Smart Transportation at New York University, the Tandon School of Engineering. We piloted several of these initiatives uh, for over three months, looking at what was the best approach for us. What did we want to ultimately install and deliver for New Yorkers to test and try? We looked at over six smart applications, and I will finish with the smart apps, which is something that most of us think when we think of smart solutions. Uh, um, but beyond just the technology pay, uh, uh, approach and definition of our smart uh, uh, lab, we looked at five maps and diagrams. We heard from Google earlier about how Google is looking at accessibility in their maps and their physical uh, 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 guides. Also four different floor treatments, those physical aspects that comprise of a smart solution for us on a transit system. You heard earlier about the imperative of getting people's inputs in the design process to become a smart city, really hearing from those end users what it is that they're lacking, what it is that would enhance their navigation through a transportation system. We heard from over 1,000 individuals what that accessibility need would look like for them and what were those enhancements that they would like to see on our transit systems. Um, and of course, we really had many conversations with our staff, our frontline workers who really deal with a lot of these enhancements out in live every day, not only dealing with clients and, and, and front facing, but also from the maintenance perspective, from the scalability perspective. And, and once we rolled a lot of these initiatives out, the durability of these projects. So, so a lot of conversation going on prior, during, and post implementation to really understand that what we provided was what was needed, that people interacted with the solutions in the way that we thought they would, and the feasibility of expanding on those initiatives. So I said earlier, um, that physical feature. This is one of my favorite uh, applications that we did at the station, which was providing our riders with an alternate accessible travel information. When a passenger approaches our station, they might find that the, the, the elevator might be out of service or they get off a station and, and they don't ex encounter what they thought they would. Well, we provide them with physical signage and also digital uh, uh, information about where the nearest accessible station was to where they were located. For whatever reason, they might have to turn around, find an alternate route. We don't just leave them on their own to figure out what that access, that alternative path is. We provide them with that information. Addition, in addition to that, we provide them with visuals uh, of the lines that they were at, at the platform, before they get to the platform in a digital format on, at home. And of course, that physical guideway to get them through our stations. As you can see, our, our physical boarding areas designating in high visibility, high contrast, where to best board the subway, and also the routes for a person with a mobility device and also a parent with a stroller who might be getting off his train and not knowing what the best route for them would be to access an elevator or an escalator or any other accessible feature of their choice. We really revamped our, our signage and enhanced the, the, the signage that was existing and the new signage that we provided, including tactile uh, uh, diagrams that, that people with low vision or people who are blind are able to interact with at the stations so that they can really understand the layout before they enter the system so that we provide them with the information that's going to allow for a successful trip navigating the station 
looking at things like tactile line maps and enhanced braille signages. We've seen now that a lot of New Yorkers actually do interact with these maps. A lot of them really feel comfortable coming back to these stations after they walk the station through on our maps and then go on independently to move around like anybody else would. Having that information, having that map, uh, uh, knowing where they were going, what they were going to encounter and how to best move around in our stations. We did the floor decals, which I spoke of earlier. We, we've seen a lot uh, of information and, and feedback from users and our employees on the durability of these assets. And a lot of the feedback has been how much New Yorkers without disabilities benefit from having this information, knowing where to go when they're moving through a particularly a complex station with several lines going through them, really taking away that, that, that fear, that confusion when you're in a subway station surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people like it is here in New York and, and really getting people where they wanna go, giving them that information in real time on the spot had provided a lot of comfort, particularly in today's time when we're trying to get as much of our riders back into the system, providing them with this information to help them have successful encounters when they move around. Sorry if I'm going too fast, but I'm trying to get us back on, on time here. So I'll provide the information and allow you to ask any questions in chat or directly later. Um, we provided some tactile and color co contrast in our floor, which is a new feature for us, giving that detectable surface application in high visibility for our low vision and blind riders to have a successful movement navigating within our stations, particularly our larger stations, uh, like I said earlier, that have a lot of lines, a lot of people in them. And, and we were concerned that someone like myself with, with, with a mobility device might, might encounter a hardship while navigating through these new applications. And luckily we, we've heard great feedback from users not at all a hindrance to anybody with a mobility device and really a lot of information that's beneficial to all riders, not just the riders with disabilities. We've heard great feedback from our tactile and color, chart, color contrasting flooring enhancements that we have there. Lastly, the applications, what you all expect we would talk about when we're talking about delivering a smart city. We partnered with proprietary services like Navalence providing QR codes for visually impaired pedestrians to get enhanced information while they're at our station and navigating through the station so that they hear out loud where they're located and what they're about to encounter as they move throughout our stations. Waymap, similar features, helping our, our low uh, uh, vision and blind pedestrians navigate our stations. Magna Carta is really helping our uh, uh, riders with cognitive disabilities, uh, um, know, get a feel, read the steps to navigate our stations, see the layout of our stations before they get there. A lot of the feedback that we've have heard uh, with persons with disabilities, particularly non-visible disabilities, is how overwhelming it is for them to get to a station and not necessarily know where to go and being rushed by a lot of people there where from the comfort of their home, their spaces, wherever they may be that they can infer information, they're able to hear a layout of our station, see that layout and hear about the best navigating path for them. They map out their route. And again, we provide them with this information ahead of time so that when they get to our stations, they are provided with the resources to move around independently and have successful interactions as they become independent users of our station. Click and go maps. It's a fantastic company that we partnered with to provide both the digital layout of our station in a tactile format for low vision and blind users, and also help us map out those most direct lines of navigation for a low vision and blind pedestrian and provide them those routes in ahead of them getting to a station so that they can walk through that station, those mezzanines, getting to that platform in their heads, understanding what they're going to encounter before they get there. And I are a, a, a navigation, enhancement application for low vision and blind pedestrians. Really, when we looked at our smart applications and what a smart city navigation would look like for our riders, we thought about providing our riders with the information that they need in anticipation of getting to a station. Access to information is access to 
independence, access to true accessibility. And that's how we define it on our station in J Street Metro Tech. If you're in New York, come to Brooklyn, check it out at J Street. That's our presentation and our new initiative for what our smart transportation system is going to look like in the future. Further enhancements that I didn't mention here, announcements from a subway of the accessible, accessibility of a station prior to arrival in Long Island Railroad, we're testing out from our maps, uh, from a digital phone, you can see the accessibility features of your station before you get to it, find out where that escalator is, that elevator, that nearest staircase maybe. And of course, with COVID, we all wanna know about how to maintain our social distance. And we provide our passengers now information on passenger load count so that people can know, riders can know which cart has the least number of people in there so that they may have the best ability to social distance. A person with a disability can know where they can access a, a, a not so crowded cart and ensure that they'll have space to, to, to move around and be at before a train arrives to a station. Again, providing our riders with all this information before they get to a station, before a train arrives, so that they can have the best experience possible while moving around in our Perfect. tentative system. Thank you very, very much for a great presentation. You can see from, uh, you have uh, several questions or comments to respond to in the chat. Um, uh, and again, thank you very much. And I, I will take your offer on it. The first uh, yes. opportunity, I'm coming to check it out. So, so thanks for that. Um, now our next speaker. Uh, he was a keynote speaker in the face-to-face -face, uh, conference, Access Israel International Conference in the past. Uh, and uh, he's very versatile, and now he's coming to lecture about a new thing, a new initiative. Uh, Yariv Bash, he is the co-founder and CEO of Flight Treks from Israel, and he's going to talk about the role of drones in accessible smart cities. Yariv, we are looking forward. Thank you, Michal. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yariv Bash, uh, co-founder and CEO of Flight Treks. I'm mostly known for Israel for a previous project, with, which was the uh, uh, spacecraft uh, Bereshit. Uh, in this picture, you can see the Earth in the background and the Israeli flag, the selfie that the spacecraft took on its way to the, uh, to the moon. Uh, this is one of the latest, last images we got from the spacecraft. You can see the same flag, and in the background, you can see the moon. Uh, unfortunately, we ended up crashing on the moon uh, in this image, you can see the before and after. A few pixels have changed after we, we landed at uh, 3,000 kilometers per hour on the surface of the moon. But you have to remember this it was a, a, a great inspirational project, an educational project. We've reached every kid in Israel uh, with our spacecraft. <laughs> I can tell you that there were a lot of kids crying that night when we crashed. But with any, any good drama, we're now building a second spacecraft. And this time it's gonna be even crazier. We're gonna have a moon orbiter and two landers. Uh, we're Israelis, if we don't succeed the first time, uh, we're gonna try something crazier the second time. Uh, I'm here to speak with you about my uh, company, Space AL. The, the space effort is a not-for-profit, uh, but my company, Flightrex, uh, which I'm the co-founder and CEO of, is a for-profit company. And what we're basically doing is we're building a, a drone delivery system that's designed for retailers and, and restaurant chains. We're already, uh, we've already rolled out with Walmart in two locations in North Carolina. So if you are residents of Fayetteville or Rayford in North Carolina, that's two suburbs of Raleigh, then you can already enjoy our services. In the image, you can see how it looks like. Uh, the drone hovers 30 meters or roughly 80 feet above your backyard and lowers the package gently on a wire to the ground. You don't have to do a thing. Everything is autonomous. And we just release the, 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 uh, the wire and fly back. The system is a lot more affordable than using humans driving a one-time car to your house. It's ultra fast. Uh, we're one of a few handful companies that are working with the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, on certifying this system as if it was a Boeing. This is going to be very safe. Uh, you've got planes that you know, carry humans and weigh hundreds of tons flying above your head. These drones are just 15 uh, kilograms or less than 50 uh, pounds. Uh, we're a lot more safer than uh, those airplanes that are flying above your head. 
And of course, minimal human interaction, so we're COVID-19 safe, and you also don't have to get dressed or tip anyone, which is also great. Uh, the idea here is to create a future of instant gratification. Uh, you'll be able to order whatever you need or want and get it almost as fast as you can order it from your smartphone. Uh, what we do is we set up locations in US suburbs, in shopping centers, and then we can get you almost anything you want from that shopping center, from different restaurants, from different retailers, all the way to your backyard, faster than it takes you to get into your car and drive to, the, uh, uh, to that shopping center. Uh, the drones uh, are actually offering a very nice addition to uh, people with uh, handicaps and disabilities. Uh, we've just, uh, one of our customers actually in Rayford is a lady with a wheelchair. I asked the team there to get us a few images, but it's going to take a few more days because we, uh, she just uh, joined the service. But think about someone in a wheelchair. You don't have to exit your house you can get almost anything you want and get it to your backyard. And we can basically mark that location in your backyard. So it will be the most... Uh, Dr. Sefi Peleg, at Lo Al Mute, at Mafria Lekulam, toda. We've got one participant who's not on mute. Uh, sorry about that. So basically we can select and pinpoint that location in someone's backyard. So it will be just right for them. So if you have a wheelchair and your backyard is not that accessible, but you have a parking lot or like a parking entrance that's a lot more accessible on your front yard, we can target that location for your deliveries. So this thing is very accessible and very nice uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, what we do is we partner with different restaurant chains and retailers and we connect to their services and of course, those services are already very accessible to people with disabilities. So really it makes it a lot easier for uh, people with disabilities. Uh, on a personal note, uh, this is me from almost a decade ago. You can see me and uh, Shimon Peres, uh, the president of Israel and, and Yanki Margalit, who was our first chairman. Uh, and a few years ago, I went on another skiing trip. You can see me here uh, with some of my buddies in that skiing trip. And this is from a few months after that. This is me in a neuro rehab doing physiotherapy. Uh, I broke my, my back and basically hit my spinal cord in that, uh, uh, in that uh, uh, skiing trip and just four years ago. And basically you, you learn how, it, how, it, you know, how to behave with a wheelchair. And you learn that that coffee shop that you went to uh, is not that accessible as you remembered it. This is me with my regular coffee place where I went with, with my friends every, uh, every weekend. And suddenly those five uh, stairs are, are like a mountain. Um, uh, but you, you know, I, I try to find solutions for everything. Uh, for instance, this is me being carried up to a second floor because I went to a friend's house and there's no elevator. This is the easy part. The hard part is going down at 2 a.m. after everybody drank a lot of alcohol. Uh, so uh, as a CEO of a company that's solving an accessibility problem, uh, while having an accessibility problem, uh, we, we try to be very uh, sensitive to the needs of you know, people with, with special needs. Uh, so I hope to see you either on the moon or in your backyard uh, in the next few years. And thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Um, and, uh, and I can't wait uh, to see, uh, to get a service from a drone, really. Um, our next speaker is Anat Kaspi, director of Taskar Center for Accessible Technology in the University of Washington, USA. And Anat will talk to us about AI for accessible sidewalks. Uh, Anat, please. Hello, um, I'd like to thank Access Israel and G3ICT for inviting me to participate today. My name is Anat Kaspi. I'm a brunette woman wearing glasses and magenta sweater speaking against an artificial background which has the logo for the Tasker Center for Accessible Technology. I'm the director of the center and we're located within the University of Washington. 
Our mission is to take technology research, develop it to deployable form, and sustainably offer end products that really enhance independence and quality of life for people with disabilities. So accessible smart cities is a topic that has really been on my mind for a long time, and particularly this past year, as we've seen so many cracks in our social systems that have and still are leaving many people behind. <laughs> so what do I bring to this conversation? Well, a few years ago, my center started a journey to provide a customized trip routing in pedestrian ways for people with mobility challenges. We saw what amazing benefits all the traveler facing routing apps like Google Directions, Movil, Move It. Um, they've all brought easy one place for people to first discover what travel options are there, second, be conveniently instructed on how to get to those services, third, be able to compare all their different travel options and all of that streamlined in just one application. So this new mobility ecosystem changed not only how people access travel information, but how people actually use travel options. So in a nutshell, these apps have been linked with more people accessing more destinations and the previous speakers have really spoken to that. But many populations that have already been travel disadvantaged have not really benefited from these applications in the same way because the applications are missing some crucial information that is really relevant to our travel. So we created a somewhat sophisticated router called Access Map. It's a custom pedestrian router application that allows people not just to say, I use a powered wheelchair or a manual wheelchair, but actually personalize to their needs regarding elevation changes, use of indoor elevator infrastructure, and their requirements about curb ramps. Access Map was truly a city scale personalized pedestrian routing for people with mobility disabilities. And our next iteration is focusing, uh, this is running beyond my, and our next iteration is focused on people with visual, vision disabilities to enable people to provide their needs and preferences about landmarks, about tactile paving, stair avoidance, and what kinds of controlled intersection preferences they have. And so as Ed Summers noted earlier, every useful civic tech app is really a complex data pipeline behind it. So we need to provide centralized, reliable, and intuitive recommendations and directions. And public agencies and private companies alike need shared human-centered data and tools. So what was hard about creating Access Map was not at all what we anticipating, because we were able to create a dynamic map. We created a calculation of accessible routes, not just wheelchair accessible, but actually tuned to those real personal experiences with devices. We were able to let people change their preferences on the fly, see how the routes change when they constrain the path to require all the curb ramps or tactile surfaces. But the issue really was the ability to create the data having good reliable data about the city sidewalk infrastructure that was missing. And as we were trying to do this, we identified that there was an abysmal state of pedestrian data out there about standardization and consistency. We thought cities would have this data regularly connected, but they didn't. We thought cities would have shared data standards that expressed all these attributes that are people facing human centric sidewalk information, but they didn't. In fact, as we started looking, transportation has focused so significantly on auto centric measures. The way cities currently measure our streets is focused on how automobiles experience that streets, how fast can a car go there, how many cars are throughput per day, but we have not really been using human-centered, pedestrian-centered metric to measure these streets. And of course we'll end up with crappy sidewalks and unwalkable streets if no one is measuring them. So while there have popped up a few building standards recently that take walking or rolling humans into account, there are still no real data or metrics to support actually fixing the infrastructure. 
So in order to scale and be able to build access map in many cities, we had to find ways to generate pedestrian centric data in a consistent manner. And we also needed to figure out what is the data that people actually needed in order to satisfy these personal needs in a very heterogeneous traveler population. So what I'm telling you about today is our use of the opportunity to use computer vision hand in hand with community collaborations to generate these data for sustainable, resilient communities. And much of our work uses computer vision, as you just saw, a video in the built environment that builds up the paths, the buildings, and the infrastructure, all collected from the perspective of a wheelchair user. This could very well be the perspective of a delivery robot or a smart bike or a parking robot. We have now a record of the environment, meaning that we can automatically reason about where are the paths, how are they connected to other paths, and where are the barriers, the pieces of the infrastructure that can enhance or prevent people from mobilizing around there. So what I wanted to share is not just having the collection of that data, but the ability to say, well, now that we have this data, what can we further do? And how does this make cities more resilient? So in, the, in face of COVID, cities um, found that they wanted to understand how the environment can make a city more resilient and as streets were slowly opening up and municipalities were considering how and where to put slow streets, it was important to know where can different pedestrians travel and are there different sidewalks that were wide enough to observe social distancing. So with the open sidewalks data, we were able to spin up very quickly a tool for cities to be able to ask these questions and even more so be able to customize their search for different types of pedestrians, being able to compare the reach between different populations. So in this slide, I'm showing a map of a neighborhood in downtown Seattle and the tool measures and shows how far a stereotypical power wheelchair user will reach starting from a particular central point here shown in purple. And the bright blue lines shows all the 400 meter routes that are accessible to this traveler. And the dark and blue lines show where a typical pedestrian with no mobility limitations might reach in 400 meters. So we already can see how this data gives the city and pedestrians an idea about the disparities about the environment for different travelers. And next is a view that shows how much of this travel will the user of a power wheelchair be able to travel on sidewalks that are wide enough for social distancing. You see that the disparity is quite different and the situation is quite different. The traveler is a lot more restricted due to the width of the street. And it's all dependent on us having this data to be able to manufacture these different paths of travel. As you see here, we're showing what a stereotypical manual wheelchair might be able to travel. And that situation is even more restricted. So in order to scale and be able to build access map, we had to find ways to generate pedestrian centric human focused data in a consistent manner. We also needed to figure out what data we actually needed. And so it all depended on working with local communities to identify what features of the environment were important for the local community. It's not just about having the interoperable mobility and transportation systems, it's about having data formats that are human centered and really expose the kind of information that people are, um, are foregrounding in different local communities. So our lesson from our experience has been a data collaborative approach to accessible smart cities. We reject the idea of subjective statements like accessible path, but really support the development of collection of standardized interoperable data that is neutral and objective about the environment. We engage stakeholders and partners on the co-design of these comprehensive human-centered data specifications. We look at API formats and all of Open Sidewalks presents API um, accessible data. And we improve civic data and tools for cities to openly share data that makes cities more usable, accessible, and resilient. 
And with that, I'm happy to um, take any questions. Please contact me at this address. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so, so much. This was fascinating. Um, uh, as you can see from, uh, from the great responses you received here. Um, uh, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, if you can unshare the gray. And now I am very happy. Another repeat, repeat uh, guest we have here. Uh, when you're really good, we, we just keep calling you back. Um, uh, our next speak speaker is Chaim Pinto. Chaim is the CTO, uh, Business Architecture Israel of Cisco Israel. Um, and he will speak about remote health. Chaim, please, thank you. Sure thing. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Let me just start by saying I am a middle aged white male with black short hair, which I'm very thankful for because most of my friends over here in Israel are already bold, uh, short trimmed uh, beard um, and um, squirrel cheeks. Um, so uh, this is pretty much how I look like uh, I, I would I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking to you today about making healthcare accessible. Um, and hopefully uh, we can see the presentation. Um, one sec. There we go. All right. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how uh, we're leveraging Cisco technology to make healthcare accessible. And in order to do that, um, I am limited to the, my 10 minutes. I'm gonna to try to take you through a very short um, um, technology uh, walkthrough on how we're building that. And then we're gonna get into the meat of it. Um, I wanna start by recognizing you know, that we have lived at least in Israel up until the last couple of weeks in a very disabled world. Uh, we had four major lockdowns. Our school system was down. We actually understood the notion and, and principle of being disabled by sticking into our apartments and houses and not be able to do the things that we typically were able to do on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that the pandemic was very um, supportive in a way to help us understand how um, challenging being disabled is. The other side of this pandemic, and if you're reading all the consultancy firms, the Gartners and so on and so forth, you realize that the biggest, biggest uh, accelerator to technical adoption and digital adoption was COVID-19. When you're talking to organizations, all of a sudden, once we were all cooped up in our houses, it was really easy to approve accelerating digital tools to make our jobs easier. As an example, if we're looking at the US alone, telehealth adoption increased by 50%, 50% from January to June, 2020. That is an outstanding number. Uh, we were not able to get through that, I believe, without dealing and coping with such a worldwide pandemic because uh, honestly for Cisco, and this is my second run at Cisco, I've worked for Cisco uh, when I was based in the US in, in 2010. Um, I have the privilege to join the, 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 the company again during this pandemic here in Israel. I can tell you that being and being accessibility focused was always the DNA of this company. And specifically as a collaboration market leader, which manufactures a lot of technologies, which we're gonna be talking about, um, we always see that as a core value. And in fact, Literally a week and a half ago, we wrapped up our first ever global Cisco Live event. And our, our CEO, Chuck Robin, stood on the floor over there addressing hundreds of thousands of our customers and literally saying that this is a part of our mission statement, which is building an inclusive future for all. And we're leveraging our position within the company and within the world to actually drive that forward. Um, when you break this down, you need to look at certain tools. I'm going to be using some names over here and we'll explain them as I go along. But WebEx, which is one of our biggest collaboration platforms, is being used today to bridge the gaps of geography, to meet us and, and, and adapt to our work styles and how we communicate and provide us with work tools 
that we want to use in this new reality, which the new reality also presented new opportunities for us to make this technology accessible, such as, very importantly, gesture recognition. Now, you might laugh about this and you might say, well, this is cool, I can do this. And then, you know, my conferencing platform will send an emoji to everyone. There's a lot more behind this. This is the basis of understanding hand gestures to understand maybe potentially sign language. So we're taking baby steps forward to understand how we can leverage technology such as artificial intelligence and blend that into the system to the benefit of all. Now, granted, most technology companies, all technology companies are for profit, right? So there is a business model behind it, but we're also making sure that we're doing the right thing over here. And I had a conversation with Yuval about a week and a half ago, I want to say, where I showed him something absolutely astonishing. Now, if you look at this picture, this is me. I'm riding my spaceship over here. The, the, the uh, fellow geeks in this conversation will recognize the awesome cockpit of an X-wing fighter uh, in Star Wars, a dream come true. <clears throat> but notice the closed captioning over here. I, I blow it up a little bit so you guys can see it. It's Hebrew, don't try to write it, to read it if you don't understand Hebrew. What's going on in the background over here, this is real time translation of English into Hebrew based on advanced technologies within the secure Cisco cloud, a technology that enables us to provide very accurate real time translations between languages. Today, first release, we're offering that as a source English language you can speak English and provide either English or pick one, any one of 100 languages to get real-time translations. We're having this call, we're having, we have about 200 individuals on the call right now on this session. Uh, we're broadcasting live uh, on Facebook. Um, we have support of hand gestures, but we don't have closed captioning. Technology enables us to do that this, you know, right now. So maybe wink, wink for the next session that we will all get together, we might choose to use the WebEx platform and enjoy this real-time translation feature where different languages can be supported at real time. If we speak English, you will get the translation in Hebrew, in Spanish, in German, or whatnot. I think that this is a key differentiator. When we're taking this and we understand that we can make the conversation accessible to individuals that are not only you know, hearing impaired, but there are different um, uh, uh, types of disabilities, um, you know, um, knowledge-based or understanding where we can actually take this um, and get a transcription of a meeting and review the information that was shared during that meeting. Uh, we can also use that to make sure that we're not missing any of the dots uh, when we're talking about making healthcare accessible. And there are plenty of opportunities to make healthcare accessible. And I wanna let you in on a little secret. I mean, when we wanna do that, we need to build the different building blocks and build the right architecture to bring the high-tech innovation to hospitals, clinics, and healthcare providers. You can see a lot of cool things in different digital tools that we're using and please don't get into the nitty gritty over here of the architecture that I put out. It's just an example, right? What I wanna say is that there's so much wealth of next generation, next generation technology that is being used for different marketing uh, campaigns and targeting advertising and, and tracking information about individuals. And we can use the basis of those technologies such as artificial intelligence and bring that forth. Right? When we're building the capabilities in the telehealth uh, um, uh, world, one of the bigger things was to build noise removal uh, into the platform. Noise removal, not in the point where you know um, we can just smooth out your voice, but literally build an artificial. We have acquired a company that allows us to have a very quiet conversation um, where all non-human voice around us 
is being artificially taken out of the conversation. Now try to imagine a very active emergency room where there's a lot of conversations and noises on the background, the ability to focus on an individual's or the doctor's or the, the healthcare provider voice and provide clear guidance onto the other side is, is literally groundbreaking that the technology exists. We're having awesome conversations with different vendor headphones and, and, and we all hear that they have built-in voice cancellation, uh, noise cancellation and so on. Bringing that into the healthcare facility is very important. Now. The other thing that we need to important to remember is that software instantiation of capabilities is cool, but we can actually do that better with different hardware capabilities, uh, which are built and are HIPAA compliant, not only from a security standpoint, but also try to think about the vocal range of uh, these devices and the ability to provide adequate uh, graphical uh, uh, resolution to individuals the ability to pick between standard base uh, 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 devices like uh, cell phones and laptops and, and extend something that is a little more high definition to meet the end user's needs. Um, the ability to share information in high resolution that we can actually scan medical information. This is critical. I mean, God forbid any of us need to have or undergo some sort of a radiology exam, uh, but if you need to do that, of bringing that analytics into your house, not going through the challenge if you're if you are disabled in a physical way and have an intimate conversation, not to wait the time that you need to schedule an appointment, travel, and go into a healthcare facility. I think that, that this is um, groundbreaking at least, but very humane because if you're going through something like that, you really want to get to the solutions as fast as you can and literally break down the barriers of the physical world. Of the ability to provide that information sometimes is rooted in the capability of using that dedicated hardware and transitioning into a virtual healthcare solution where at home we can initiate the process through software, right? And not travel all the way into a facility, which sometimes can be not only during pandemic times, but harsh weather and other external variables, very challenging to an, a, a disabled individual. Um, bringing that capability to everyone, regardless of their state is critical and, and exposing the information through the different tools, but having that um, options within the healthcare facility is critical. So in the provider's premise, those devices can reside. The other side can be anything from a mobile device all the way to, a, to a, a, a computer or a large screen gaming PC that you're using to play Fortnite at your leisure. Um, the mix of hardware and software actually is the, the, the secret to bring this to everyone and meet everyone's needs. Um, the loudspeakers, the microphones, the sensitivity, the resolution, the contrast, the color coding, all those elements are critical when you're delivering sensitive information for sure, but specifically as we're discussing medical information. The biggest roadblock that was faced, everybody faced as we're dealing with sensitive regulated information was security, privacy, and compliance. Guys, this is solved, this is done. I mean, no harder regulation, regulations are being applied on banking institutions dealing with our money. Of course, our health uh, data is critically important and we need to keep the privacy of everybody. If we solve the banking challenge, we can definitely solve the healthcare challenge. Glad to say that with the Cisco Telehealth solution, we took on that challenge and, and we were able to jump over that hurdle and just smooth that transition. I added some and I'm finishing over here, Michal. I see Perfect. you, I see you, this is the last slide. You Okay, yeah, we get this, right? Just a couple of quotes, just to explain to you guys what this means to the healthcare providers. They want to be there. They want to be there for everyone. They do not want to drag everybody into their facility if that is, and I say drag, right? It, if this is not really necessary, they understand where we live and this technology allows them to actually get to everybody that they want. So, we're committed to continue doing this. 
worldwide, over 10,000 hospitals and clinics, over 3,000 life science manufacturers across 118 countries worldwide. This is a powerhouse of innovation set not only for you know the shareholders revenue, but definitely to our community because our purpose as defined this year by our CEO and, and go on to the websites and search this. This is Cisco's purpose published to all. We are powering an inclusive future for all. One of the you know most meaningful and, and easy to stand behind uh, purposes that I've ever seen from a leader in the technology space. As promised, Michal, I'm done. Thank, Thank you very much. For Thank you attention. very much. Uh, Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Now just unshare uh, your screen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now we're going into a series of, um, you know, whenever we, we plan these webinars, we, I, I promise you, we start with two hours or two and a half hours, but we have really such amazing speakers, such amazing technologies that we just can't say no. And now we are have, uh, we have four um, uh, great um, uh, presenters uh, that are going to give uh, uh, a little shorter uh, presentation, but we had to include them. Our first one is Renee uh, Perkins. She is the CEO and co-founder of City Mass, M-A-A-S, from the UK. And she will talk about Mobility Map, a digitally inclusive journey. Renee, please. Thank you so much, Michal. I uh, hope everybody can hear me and I'll just go ahead and share my screen. that looking okay everybody yes just to make it into slideshow there we are perfect brilliant um as traditions so i'm going to try to describe myself i am a chinese female um with dark long hair with a dark top a v-neck that top um a virtual background so with a sitemas logo and the sitemas products logos on us as well because I don't want to show you the messiness and the fun that my children's having currently. I'm in the room of their playroom. So um, that's me today. I'm joined with our partnership manager, Louis. So I'm going to hand over to Louis to describe him and take you guys through some of the pain points that he's been facing. Over Hi, to everyone. Louis. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Louis Kentuhi Castro. I'm a white male with a magenta shirt. I also have the uh, same background as Renee. Um, I am a mobility, uh, a power wheelchair uh, user due to a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. And mobility independence is a daily battle for myself, others in the disabled community, as well as the aging community. And in reality, our world is designed for the abled, and accessibility is generally an afterthought. Um, just one example of, of many is um, someone will find their dream home and they will make a purchase and move in. And that doesn't really work for me. Um, if I'm lucky enough to find an accessible home, I also have to make sure that the area around it is going to cater for my accessibility needs. And as um, <laughs> Renee knows, obviously, that uh, I've recently relocated to the UK and we've purchased a home and my partner spent hours in the car driving around uh, trying to find the accessible homes, uh, disabled parking, shops, medical facilities and, and etc. And as Megan from Google and many others have uh, highlighted is that this information is never easily available on an online search uh, when you're looking for an accessible area or facilities that cater for those needs. And that is what we really want to change in the world. And uh, we at Cinemas are extremely passionate about bridging this divide for real-time online and offline data to be available to all. And uh, I'll now hand you back to Renee so she can show you what we've been doing. Thank you so much, Louis. Um, today, I'm very excited to talk to you about three case studies using our mobility map. 
And the first one is a global platform that enabling that inclusive living, solving some of the problems that Louis just described in terms of uh, housing problems. And the second one is a wide label mobility map tackling transport poverty that we did for a public bus company in Portugal. And the third one is really important digital inclusion that is vital for a post COVID world because everything has been digitalized. We can see in today's presentations from healthcare to drone. Uh, delivery, uh, uh, accessible map, uh, everything is online. So how can we address that digital inclusion problems? Now, before we dive into City Mass Solutions, I'd like to take your journey in terms of City Mass as an organization. The pain points that are particularly really related to, to Cornell's uh, presentation was that I am actually a young parent with two young uh, daughters. And when I was uh, traveling with trams in, uh, in in city in London, and at, uh, at a peak time as well, trying to carry the ram to, to stairs and going to the accessible platform, et cetera. And we find that particular information is not for, widely available for, for me to have that um, uh, 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 travel at ease. And that problem actually exacerbated by uh, my family in law's uh, foster, foster disabled children, where occasionally where we want to go out and find accessible places to celebrate occasions of birthdays. And we find it very difficult to find out the accessibility information of any places of interest, so like it be restaurants or the stations or even hospitals sometimes. Um, so, City Mass organizations actually has been doing one and a half years of research and co-developed, co-research and co-tested our technologies with our charity partners in the UK. To just to name a couple of them, Disability Ray UK, Royal National Institute for Blind, Neil Nachester Scope. And we have been through some really lucky to support by uh, prestigious incub incubators, including Microsoft and JP Morgan and London Mayor Office. We are a multi-award winning organization. We're happy to be working on multiple projects with um, uh, Grant Thornton's, PwC, Atos, um, just to name a few. Now let's dive into the City Mass solution on its own. We, as organization, create a microservice level to tackle online and offline accessibility. Um, so the first one, we look at our mobility map, providing the physical location data in terms of its accessibility. The second one, the wide label mobility, map that which I will take you through as a um, as, as a case study and the third one is that so important user experience that every single um, presenters has been talked about making user centric makes it usable for everybody assist me is that digital tool to achieve that vision now mobility mapped um, that we have a demo here which uh, feel free to have a look it's a YouTube channel where you'll be able to uh, have subtitle on it as well. We're in our platform is a global platform providing that um, personalized accessibility information. You can see the green is accessible. Uh, a, a green route is accessible. Um, uh, orange uh, uh, square is partially and the red is um, red triangle is not accessible. And it's that uh, inclusive design principle that we incorporate into every single technology that we developed. Um, now, our platform is special in the way that it visualized accessibility information on the map, um, but also utilize our capability of machine learning. We are at the moment able to predict any accessibility data on any place basis of interest and accuracy of 86%. And we continuously improve the accuracy and we're currently working with our, um, working with Alan Turing Institute. In fact, our projects just kick off the same day today um, to continuously improve the predictions and the usability of our data. Now on our platform, we're able to provide categories providing parking, disabled parking base, whether it's accessible for wheelchair users. Um, and um, whether it's shop or the accommodations, the places of interest, and we have our, our voice assistance as well to help people to search by voice and provide a real time journey uh, planations. Um, and we also have provide a user centric um, platform, enable users to crowdsource back that all very important quality and quantitative feedback to, work to help the community avoid that travel, anxiety, and stress. And business community can be in our platform signed up and providing localized accessibility information so that they can get access to uh, for everybody, not just the able bodied. So, Close moving on to that use. Thank you. We're closing remarks. Okay, I'm not even finished the first um, 
first case study. So the first case study, what we're looking at here is uh, our mobility map can be applied to be uh, across um, to housing markets where we can supply our data to enable any renters or buyers to discover the right um, locations for them to buy or rent. And our white label mobility map not only provide that user centric information and accessibility information at global level, we also provide operators dashboard to enable the efficient operations. That's one of the findings we have. 87% of people using our mobility map will be able to, um, to come out of travel, transport poverty to find employment in the cities and then find 79% of them will save a lot of times over five minutes. So assist me, is that a very important digital inclusion to where provide usability of our, our, um, uh, our technologies that can integrate it into any websites, provide a personalized <coughs> user journey by users controlling the UX UI elements, whether it's change text sizes, or whether it's to um, change the contrast on the contents, the, 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 the style adjustments, the validate, val uh, the navigation adjustment for vision how to read out a page, etc. Now, our fight for digital exclusion does not stop there. We develop an, a technology called Aware at the moment to help developers and coded to actually start the digital inclusion journey from the beginning, embracing the inclusive design journeys right from the beginning. Now, one of our clients actually used our, our technology. They can find 2,600 percent increase in its engagement and 230 percent increase in the user unit visitors. We can visually see the impacts of the uh, digital inclusions on businesses and organizations. Now I just want to sort of quickly wrap up, uh, take a deep breath. Technology is really not, to not a privilege, it really is a tool to succeed. So together with our mobility map and city mass technology, we can create an inclusive, digitally inclusive journey together. So feel free to reach out to myself and Louis, and, and that's City Mass. Thank you very much. I'll tell you the truth, I'm pretty bad at my job because I'm supposed to be the timekeeper, but you guys really are fascinating and interesting, and it's really difficult for me. Uh, so thank you, and um, uh, we are going to rush into our next uh, technology. Okay, I'm going to give it a try. Faustino Cuadrado Capitan, CEO of Mass Factory Urban Accessible Mobility. Uh, I am really looking forward to hearing more from you, please. And just if Hello. you can, uh, Renee, uh, un uh, unshare your screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. One second. Yeah. One second. Renee will unshare. Just stop for me. Okay. Perfect. There we go. And now we see your screen, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm Faustino Guerrosi of Mass Factory. I'm a bit more than middle aged uh, male, uh, have brown hair, uh, white beard, and I, I wearing glasses. And I guess I'm also wearing a pink uh, shirt because uh, I'm not sure because I'm colorblind, but it, it should be. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to share with, with you uh, our system, which is called Avantone Companion. And indeed, uh, thanks uh, to Access Israel for organizing this excellent webinar and for uh, your invitation. Avantone Companion is uh, an assisted transport system allowing people living with disabilities or with memory dysfunctions to use public transport as a regular transport mode. The system comprises Trip planning, guidance, super, and supervision, and personal support. Somehow, it's, uh, we are gathering many of the things that we have seen during during the, the webinar. So I'm pretty happy to be one of the latest because I think I can I can take advantage of the previous previous explanations. Allow me now to illustrate you with with a video. What is Companion? My name is Sophie, and I'm not born yet. But when I am, I'll be different. My parents noticed it quickly. And when I was diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, they understood. 
understood that I wouldn't be looked at like the others. Some tried to hide their glances. Some not so much. And I can see in their eyes that I'm not like them. Today, I'll go unnoticed. I'll look just like another teenager on her phone, taking the bus. I'm free. Free to go wherever I want. Well, our users are people with intellectual disabilities, as you have seen in the, in the video, uh, in the previous video, but we are also users with having physical disabilities or sensory disabilities, blind people or deaf blind people, people with mental or memory disorders, senior citizens and, 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 and immigrants as well in, in, in some, some of our clients. How, do, how, can, how does uh, the companion work? This is the system. Uh, it com uh, comprises uh, a mobile app, which is used by the end user, uh, which is providing the indications to do this step-by-step -step navigation, according and, and taking into account the, the user skills, and, and a web app where the carriers or, or watchers are taking care of the users. If you look at the control center where they are, what we have the operator role, or we have in the relatives tutor, we have the assistant role. The only difference between, between those two roles are there is only one role taking, a, taking, in, not taking control of the, any incident that may occur during the trip, but they both can do almost the same. And we have also a city angels network of, of volunteers uh, that in case that uh, the user requires in-person assistance they will go directly to the closest one will go to uh, will go to to provide the the support to the end user the system as well we have seen here is also has has the mobile app but also have the web app the web app is used for two main functionalities one is the trip planning the trip planning is very flexible and it controls everything that it can be controlled beforehand uh, i mean we we, we have we have the validity of the trip and from what day to another, what day, the, 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 the arrival time or the starting time of the trip, the, the transit agencies, whether they are banned or they are preferred, and, and also um, they take into account whether you are a wheelchair user in order to uh, provide you the best uh, or the closest station that taking into account the stiffness of the, of the of the ground we can send uh, in which sidewalk and the user will go will we walk we we, we are not uh, using the middle of the street in order to provide in, uh, indications to our users so because we have many kind of different users and it's a must for us to use the sidewalk so we we uh, step we step the 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 the, the, the trip in, in in the sidewalk and also the the intersection across in the street so everything is is fixed uh, during the configuration of the trip and we are we also uh, set the point where the user will uh, will receive the the indications and also the content of the indication everything is personalized according to their user skills the other main functionality of the web app is the the monitoring of the user we have um, a main screen where we have all users going around active users and the the Below the the, the, the the bottom of this the screen, we have the open incidents that that uh, are occurring during the trip. If you click on top of one of the users, you go to a special or, or, or a user screen where we we have all the information.
You are on mute, Faustino. You are on mute. Yes, you are on mute. Maybe some problem. Uh, but I, I just mute or, or you heard before? No, no, no we just, heard just, just now okay. you're on mute. Uh, just, just now, finish. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And while we have now the, the smartphone app, uh, what you see, well, the, the, which is quite important, the user interface is quite flexible. We have audio, text, pictograms, images, vibration, and math. All this information that is provided by the, by the mobile app is configured in the trip planner. So we have to, we have to add the information in the, in the trip planner in order to get this information from the mobile app. As you will see here, we have always on the top the help button. Uh, if the user taps this uh, help button, uh, and the, the, smart, the app dials directly to a pre-configured uh, telephone number. We have the pre-configured trips uh, in this main screen. And once the, the, the user chooses one of the, these trips, the system starts to provide indications to the user in order to reach the destination is a step is a navigator and step by step navigator in order to have control of the trip we we are monitoring many things during the trip not only during the trip also before the trip so we check where the user is asking for doing a trip in the right date and time if, the, if there is the right starting point if it has enough coverage from the gps network and the mobile network the battery charge of the of the device and also if the user choose the, the, the right trip. And when the, when the user is on the trip, we, we control whether the user is progressing uh, accordingly or the, the user went out of the route, where the user is in the right transport, the transport is coming earlier, later than expected. If the user uh, got off in a wrong stop or if the user uh, didn't get off of the transport, coverage, always we control the coverage of the, of the network, both GPS and mobile and for sure where the user uh, tap the help button. In order to do that, we have developed uh, some proprietary algorithms. This is the, one, of, uh, one of them is the, the guidance uh, technologies, the PDGA algorithm that we built at polygons where uh, let's say is the limiting the, 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 the path of the, 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 the user can do. So we are ensuring that the user has to follow this route. If the user goes out of this route is when we, we, we have an incident which is called auto route and we take control of the user in order to uh, bring them back to bring, bring him back to the, to the right path. I need you to really get to closing steps. Yeah, yeah, I'm closing. Sorry. Thank you. I am closing. This is, and we have the, the predictive algorithm in order to provide the best guidance instructions because for blind people, we cannot, we cannot provide uh, bad instructions. Our clients are transit agencies transit uh, authorities like the, the Metropolitan Transport Authority of Barcelona and like in Spain also on face also one of our customers. We have the system has some benefits. One of them is the economic because uh, if you compare the cost of paratransit compared to the, the, the cost of the public transport, uh, you are saving a lot of money for each trip but it's much more important than the social impact because the users are, instead of going in paratransit or with volunteers or with taxis, they are using the public transport like the rest of us. And, and, and they are increasing their mobility because they, they don't depend on nobody else rather than the Avanton companion, our, our, our application. We have plenty of awards from Fundacion, from Vodafone Foundation, Red Cross and, and some others. And there is also a Springer uh, released a, a book last year, which is called Towards User-Centric Transport in Europe. If you buy it, you, you will find a chapter devoted to Up and Down Companion as well. And you will find here more information about Up and Down Companion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I must say, I loved your video that you showed at the beginning. Very thank powerful, very, very strong. Uh, thank you very much. And now to our next um, technology, I am very happy to invite Carlo Castellano, CEO of Park for Dis from Spain. Well, not really from Spain, but I'll let you, I'll let him uh, tell you all about exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, first of all, for this invitation. This is amazing. I don't know if you can see the screen right now. And uh, let me see. We can see the screen. It's not a presentation. I think. Okay. You need to so this on. is the presentation, right? 
Yes. Correct. Okay. So, sorry, it was just in the middle. Okay. So, first of all, I'm a, like Faustino, more than a middle aged uh, Italian white uh, man with um, few ears, uh, mostly green. And uh, in my in uh, my back uh, in my background there is a, a old uh, galleon uh, that was made by uh, it's a model of galleon usually made by my godfathers a lot of years ago. So would we'll start to to explain you uh, a personal problem. This is a, this is a story terror based on my experience. I was born with a problem to my right leg. Then uh, I I try to find out a solution for me and for more than. Five million people in Europe that, when start when when uh, when have to to start a trip or using the car, uh, doesn't know where the parking are to uh, locate it, where the, the parking spots are located. Okay, this issue that maybe for somebody is, is just a pain. No, don't don't find uh, a, a parking spot in uh, uh, when you are destined in forever. For, uh, for, for tourism or if you want to, to go to have a dinner outside is a pain, but for us, for our group, is the difference between having autonomy or sometimes staying at home. And this lack of information uh, becomes a lack of, of autonomy and sometimes we incur in infringements because the way, uh, the place where you can park in addition to the parking spot, okay? Uh, the current offering is, a look, is, is just very few local smart sol city solution uh, where the the center is the city and not the user this is a, this is a shame because sometimes they don't realize the city when uh, uh, spend a lot of money that uh, we need and uh, we our group need an intersect cross sectional interurban solution in order to have just one uh, web app in order to address our problem and not uh, download several apps de de depending on the city that we want to, to visit, okay? And we summarize all the information in an accessible way. Um, part for this is divided in two main areas. Part for these people is a set of uh, features that uh, with the web and app previous and during the, the, the trip, uh, the, the final user can uh, use in order to have a global view of the PRM spots and, uh, and be guided until the spot you want to occupy close to the, the, the destination. But also the regulation of the parking uh, uh, related to the other allowed sp parking spots, you know? like for example, the, the low down load and whatever. And we can report also incidents on call the local police when we have uh, some problems and at uh, PRM spots by our, ourselves. That's why we, we reach it a, a, a very, very important KPI through the participation of more than 800 volunteers in mapping uh, our solution. Uh, and also we can uh, reset the spots. And um, this is completely free. And then we have a set, a set of um, a tool for asset management in order to allow to, to the municipalities and the final uh, customers to manage their own asset in order to uh, always um, improve the autonomy of the, the final user that is always the center of all the, th the, the social project, okay? Uh, the, the impact is clear, okay? Improve PRM autonomy, promote accessible tourism, and reduce also the use, um, let me say, of uh, you disability card in a wrong way, because you know that there is a, um, a driver and no driver, and sometimes the the 85% of no driver EU uh, cards are used in uh, not uh, real uh, mm, misused way. Okay, but sometimes it's also fraud. Uh, we are light obviously with the SD, SDG uh, 10, 11, and 17 with significant KPI, more than 36,000 spots, mainly in, in Spain and now also in Italy and Portugal, with growing very quickly to old Europe. And the usage example, in addition to the one-to-one -to -one, uh, um, uh, city halls, we are focused also in tourism, public entities, and uh, in uh, IoT and smart cities project. And in the B2B, we are uh, also approaching large shopping center and airport 
where our spots are very uh, interesting because in the first line and uh, the common people use them uh, in in uh, in uh, you know in uh, in a wrong way okay so so that's why we we provide this information the this solution to this uh, shopping center in the airport uh, we also had uh, several hours and uh, we uh, participate to incubate those acceleration prog uh, programs but especially i want to raise the that I was appointed like the Spanish entrepreneur with disabilities of the year 2001, 2020, sorry. Uh, and last, last slide is also to say that we are starting this change of paradigm from smart city to smart human city, where the, the center is the user. We already started. I, and we hope that we, we, may, we, uh, we may count on you uh, as well, okay? Thank you very much for all. Thank you, you. you my... thank you. Thank you very much. And Maybe again, um, I'm receiving uh, WhatsApp uh, announcements. Please make sure to upload this and your information uh, in the global website. I, I have a feeling you're going to get some uh, questions regarding this. I so rush very much, eh? Okay, so don't complain. Thank you. thank you. Our last final speaker, and we're saving the, the best for last, Rushi, I, I really hope you will agree with that. We have Rushi Rama, Smart Cities Lead, World Economic Forum from the USA, uh, and uh, Rushi um, uh, will uh, talk about G20 WEF Smart City Initiative. Thank you, Rushi. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for allowing me some space on the agenda. Um, I'm going to be brief because considering we're going slightly over. Um, so as, as we just said, I'm the Smart Cities Lead in the World Economic Forum, and I'm here today to talk about our project, the G20 Global Smart Cities Alliance, uh, in which uh, accessibility has played quite a, a major role. So I'll just, uh, I only have a few slides to share, um, which should help to keep to time. Uh, we have been working on this since 2019. In 2019, the G20 uh, basically called for the creation of this Smart Cities Alliance under the Japanese government's leadership. And the point of this alliance is to deal with technology governance problems. Uh, this fundamentally is what we see as being the uh, major challenge in the smart city space. Um, and it covers a whole range of issues, uh, including, as you can see on the bottom there, uh, social disruption and exclusion. Um, now, in terms of what that means in reality, it means that we've been trying to put together a policy roadmap. Um, so when I talk about policy roadmap, we're trying to do something which is very practical, which we can give to city officials and governments around the world, and which they can then go and implement. And to start that process, we put together five model policies. Um, these policies are just a handful of what's going to be needed. Uh, we think there's going to be something like 30 or 40 needed eventually, but the first one that we started with, and it's a signal of our priorities, was around accessibility. Uh, we worked closely with uh, you know, T3ICT and James Thurston to put this together, and he frankly um, has been a, a, a very, uh, very productive leader for us in, in, in making sure that this policy came together. Um, you can see here a lot of the content on the slide, which I'm not going to go through in detail, but our ambition with this policy, which we want to have implemented in cities around the world, is to make sure that whenever a city commissions or builds a digital service of any kind, frankly, it just makes use of the already existing accessibility standards that are in place. And for many of you on this, uh, uh, you know, in this webinar, this will not be news uh, because you yourselves will have used these accessibility standards extensively. And you may be thinking, you know, should this not be obvious? And yet our survey, which we've just conducted across uh, nearly 40 cities around the world, shows that these standards are actually not being used, even though they may legally uh, be a requirement. And so it's important for us to make sure that these basic standards are in place before we start to go further in the smart city space. Um, you can see here Yuval's name is on this list as well, and I'm very grateful to Access Israel's participation in making this, uh, this policy happen. Um, in terms of what is going to happen next, uh, we have 13 cities that want to uh, try this out already, and you can see here they're globally very well spread out. I'm hoping that these 13 will act as an inspiration for many other cities around the world after we conclude our, our, you know, our, our implementation by the end of this year. And we'll be rolling this out much further than this 
in the coming years. So that's everything really <laughs> that I wanted to cover with you. I focus very much on accessibility. We're doing much more than that, but I thought it's a good uh, snapshot for you. Amazing. Thank you very, very much. Um, first of all, guys, 16 minutes late than the schedule. I think we're okay. Um, um, for me, it's, you know, I'm, I'm uh, fashionably late by half an hour at least every time. So um, first of all, I would like to thank all our amazing, amazing speakers. I did receive some uh, uh, questions in the chat. Some of the speakers were having some problems uploading the presentations. Sharon will be in contact with you, uh, giving you exact uh, um, um, uh, instructions so everybody can enjoy and continue, as I said, the ripple effect. Um, and please keep us in the loop. We love to hear about things that are growing from these uh, webinar series. Now, um, uh, again, we have um, uh, amazing uh, responses in all the medias that we have. Um, and I can assure you there are some people somewhere around the world waking up now and emailing us now and asking to uh, when, when, when and where can they find the recording because this webinar is going to continue to show and spread throughout the world. Um, uh, this is the whole idea, sharing, talking, spreading, learning. Uh, I cannot wait uh, for our next webinar already, which will be scheduled at the end of May, um, and more information will be received shortly. I would like to thank all participants from everywhere around the world. Uh, thank you uh, for the Access Israel staff, for G3 ICT, our great, great partners, and uh, for everybody else who is going to listen and join us later. Thank you very much, guys, and have a great morning afternoon, evening, or night. Bye from Israel. Bye-bye from Israel. Feel bye. free, whoever is new, we want to hear you now. Say bye-bye. Where are you from? Where are you going to? Ciao de Chile. <laughs> Chile. Hello there. How are you? <laughs> Perfect. Bye-bye from the Bahamas. From Florida. Bahamas, Florida. Thank you, from Vancouver. Canada. <laughs> Bye-bye from Costa Rica. Costa Rica, wow. Well, bye-bye from Stuttgart, Germany. It was good bye -bye. to see you. Bye-bye from Israel. Bye-bye from, bye -bye from uh, bye -bye Brussels, from Belgium. Bye-bye from Innsbruck, Austria. From Paulo, Brazil. And of course, I'll stop the bye-byes just to say Richard and um, Pam. Thank you so much for the sign language. Richard is always... Uh, um, uh, you know, the rock star of the evening, uh, along with Pam, I really, really appreciate it. And we can all go like this. Shoni, you're doing a, a little photo here. Everybody's clapping their hands, big smiles, and we have a picture. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. No, <laughs> Okay.